Good, good morning, members. We've started. <laughs> But I think we have we have some members are having a bit of a problem logging in or being pushed out. So, but we are Corian and we have our witnesses. Okay, so moving on then to item number two, which is chair's business. Um, at two point one, at page four of your packs, it is NI Chambers quarterly economic survey report infographic. Then there's a press release at page six and the actual survey report at page nine. Um, NI Chamber and BDO published the survey on the 12th of January, showing that a majority of local businesses believe the prospects for the economy this year are weak and over a third plan to reduce capital investment into their businesses. Um, the report is a very useful snapshot of the views and activity across the, the Chamber's membership and, and I think it, it um, is really helpful to us in terms of understanding what's going on out there at the minute and how and businesses view it and, and how they're planning for the, the year ahead. So it's to note unless members have any specifics that they want to make up um, on it. Great. Okay, moving on then. Um, just last Thursday morning we had uh, an informal meeting with um, UU lecturers. Uh, the committee was invited to, to that. Um, the lecturers raised some issues in relation to um, a rise in the level of fees for diplomas and part-time degrees across a range of subjects. While the numbers have held up for this year, or for, for the part-time degrees previously, there's a concern that the rise in the cost of the diplomas has put people off, and then those who would be completing diplomas are moving in to, to part-time degree courses. Um, would then be, um, would then, you know, that that's a, a key source of recruitment um, and any drop off in numbers and diplomas would then have a knock on impact in terms of the part time degree. Um, there it seems to be a situation where while the part time degree courses are worth approximately a third of the credits of a full time degree, um, I think it can now cost two thirds of the cost of a degree. So that effectively means that um, a part-time method of completing a degree would cost twice as much as a full-time one undertaken as one block. So lecturers are fearing that this will potentially discourage recruitment to the to part-time degree courses. Um, and there are, are concerns around the, the cohort, I suppose, that would be moving into part-time um, education. It is, is likely to be different from that. Um, you would be, you know, be undertaking full-time degree courses. So it's something that, that I think is concerning um, and it's something that, that I think uh, as a committee that we would like to take up with um, Ulster University if members would be content with that. Um, John O'Dowd was also at the meeting so he might want to, to reflect on um, and his um, view of it as well. No, sorry, I think you've covered it all really. Um, I think it would be Good if the committee was to write uh, and find out more details on, on a supportive manner of the issues raised. Uh, sorry, Chair, can I just come in there uh, as well? Okay, yeah, um, I, I think that the diplomas are a really good escalator into um, higher education, I, I suppose, you know, for po people that maybe uh, put off going to university after school, etc. And, and a good few years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, um, the old department, the Delhi department, actually sponsored um, uh, degrees or diplomas. Uh, and it was really, really effective because, um, and they worked with, with businesses in order to kind of co-sponsor it. Maybe something like that could be set up again. It was like leadership and management courses. Uh, and it really was, it, it was very effective uh, for getting people, you know, on that, that career pathway. 
So maybe that's something that we could, you know, ask the department to give consideration to uh, and revisit. Yeah, thanks for that, Sinead. Um, I think that it's something that is part of the wider skills strategy. Um, Chair, yeah, yeah, members, if, you, if uh, members recall the skills briefing we had um, last week, I think it's something that can be worked into the skills academies and also the ideas around um, assured skills as well as the, the help that's now being given to individual businesses. I think what, what officials were sort of saying was, and I suspect it's a funding gap, is helping the smallest businesses. So your, your kind of, you know, sub micro businesses of, of maybe one to five people is how do you get them into the program? So there was some discussion last week about um, doing that in a collaborative way. So the, the department sponsoring training for a young person to work across a number of micro companies. So what we can do, Chair, is we can talk again to the skills uh, officials and see how they can expand that out better and work more closely with the universities in terms of the diplomas. Also, the, um, the colleges offer um, you know, equivalents to that with, with the HNDs, HNCs and so on. So I suppose it's, it's that whole getting that coordinated in the round. But that's, hopefully that's something that can come out of um, the skills micro inquiry and we can push for in the skills strategy. Chair, will you copy that into the private office as well, your correspondence yes. to the universities, please? Thanks, Gordon. Thank you. Okay, then, so moving on to item number three, which is our draft minutes. There's a copy of the draft minutes from last week's meeting on the 13th of January at page 20 of your packs. Our members contend that those are an accurate reflection of the meeting. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So moving on then now to item number four, which is our briefing from our academics at Queen's um, on the UK-EU trade cooperation agreement and its impact on the protocol. So there is a clerk's memo at page 30 of your packs. Um, the memo reflects the aspects of the trade and cooperation agreement between um, the British government and the EU. Um, this briefing that we are getting this morning from um, Professor Katie Hayward and Professor David Finnamore is to deepen the committee's understanding of the TCA and how it interfaces with the protocol and what the likely impacts of that is for businesses, um, trade and consumers more generally. And so I'd like to, to welcome to this morning's meeting um, Professor Katie Hayward, who is um, Professor of Political Sociology at Queen's and Professor David Finnamore, who is Professor of European Politics at Queen's. So if I hand over to yourselves to make an opening statement and then we'll open it up to members. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, so I'm going to begin um, by outlining the TCA and its link to the protocol, and then I'll pass over to David to um, give his analysis and look ahead. Um, so just, uh, I think a, a couple of important uh, beginning points is to recognise that uh, we're still at the process of provisional application of the trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and the EU. So it's going through the process now of the European Parliament scrutinising it. And they've made it clear that they're not going to be rushed in that process. Um, uh, they're going to be very careful in their uh, approval of it. They need to give consent to it before then the member states uh, confirm that they also approve the TCA. So just to bear in mind, it is provisional at the moment. Another point to make about the TCA is that, uh, that it was fairly hastily made. Um, and, and the focus was very much about achieving the UK's objectives, which was obviously um, reclaiming sovereignty, minimizing ties with the European Union, and we see that reflected in the nature of the deal. One last point is about the lack of UK scrutiny of the details of the deal. We know that um, the UK Parliament um, approved it in a very short time frame, um, and that there will be consequences of that. I think potentially that um, the details and the small um, fine print of the uh, TCA will um, only be recognised over time. Lawyers will be busy, I suspect, in the coming years. And there's also quite a lot of bureaucracy surrounding uh, the TCA. Many specialised committees, for example, associated with the running of various parts of it. They'll be making decisions around reviewing it, etc. So uh, there is a sense of um, a, a work in progress. We're still to see uh, the, the full meaning of this TCA come into, come into play. So, um, as you're all aware by now, the, the TCA has three pillars to it. There's the, um, the 
FTA part of it, which covers um, a range of areas, including energy and transport. We have the second pillar, which is law enforcement and judicial cooperation, um, a really important area. And then we have the final part, which is overarching governance. There are also some unilateral decisions that have significance. For example, the unilateral decision around uh, data adequacy, um, which runs out in six months time. So the FTA can be, the, the TCA that we have, the FTA, part of it can be summarized as being a fairly thin deal that does nothing in itself, uh, does very little to soften the Irish uh, sea border, so to speak. Um, and if we step back to the timing of the, um, of the TCA, obviously being announced on Christmas Eve, um, it, it, this came just a week after we had the decisions from the Joint Committee around uh, the implementation of the protocol. And we've been waiting for those decisions because, as you know, businesses have been told on many important areas regarding information for goods crossing from GB into NI that we're still waiting for decisions to be made at the UK EU level. Um, uh, a part of that, those decisions, um, so those decisions were facilitated by um, the UK um, agreeing to uh, drop what it had proposed to do in the UK internal market bill and the taxation bill, which would have been unilateral action um, counteracting the protocol in some areas. Um, and so, in and of itself, that we've, the fact that we had those decisions um, confirmed on the 17th of December were very important, particularly important for obviously Northern Ireland. Um, so those decisions um, with regards to implementing the protocol, I wouldn't say that they're necessarily mitigations. It's important that they are recognized as being grace periods. They have an end point um, and uh, those end points are, are, are quite sharp. So the first one, of course, is the 1st of April for ending the grace period with regards to SPS rules. Um, for goods moving from GB to NI, was specifically the fact that we don't need the full um, official certification for those goods to enter Northern Ireland, but they will be needed after the 1st of April. We have the grace period on animal products, um, particular ones, chilled meat, etc. Um, after that point, after the 1st of July, they won't be allowed into, um, into Northern Ireland from GB. Um, just as those goods can't go from the into the EU. And then we have the 12 month um, adaptation period for human and veterinary medicines. Um, in relation to all of these, we've got a UK unilateral declaration to align with the EU rules um, up to the, the end of those points, after which the UK can diverge. Um, and I think that's important to recognize that the more the UK diverges from the EU rules, the more um, implications there will be for GB to NI movement of goods. Um, just in terms of the analysis of the FTA, I think that the critical point is that it's extremely unusual for any free trade agreement to be adding friction. Um, that's, that's basically the opposite of what most FTAs do. So this is a really peculiar arrangement in and of itself, and it's worth recognizing that, I think, because essentially in and of itself, the integration that we um, have um, between the UK and the EU um, uh, is based on that, that, that context of EU membership. And now that is no longer there, we don't have that framework for the level of integration that existed before. And the same is true in consequence of the protocol, therefore, we, we have to expect that it will um, cause disruption and change in, in, in relation to the integration that is, um, was previously experienced between GB and NI particularly in economic terms, I'm not talking any other terms. Um, and I'm just to mention um, four things before I conclude in relation to the TCA that are significant. Um, so on agri-food, there's no equivalence made between the UK and the EU in relation to SPS standards, no mutual recognition of compliance, for example. Um, and this highlights the importance of um, export health certificates that will be required on more goods coming in after the 1st of April. Um, and it does mean that those checks on agri-food um, are particularly significant um, after that time. This is why the EU is being very careful about it. Um, also in relation to the, the TCA, the rules of origin um, issue is, a, is an important one. Um, and I think this possibly reflects the fact that Again, we have a very unusual situation. Um, it's very unusual for um, the EU to do anything with a country uh, expecting that goods will go from the EU into the third country 
uh, and then back into the EU again. And simply the nature of um, the, the UK land bridge um, and the nature of trade between uh, the UK and the EU, including Ireland, that just means that this rules of origin issue is, is particularly complicated. Um, services, again, this is extremely thin in the TCA, uh, which will have implications longer term for the island of Ireland in particular. Um, and the most obvious one in relation to that is mutual recognition of qualifications. So essentially what we're looking at here is country by country, profession by profession agreement. Um, and then finally, on the level playing field issue, as we're all aware, this is a really um, controversial element of coming to agreement between the UK and the EU. On state aid, um, Northern Ireland is in a different position. EU state aid rules will apply to Northern Ireland. Um, and this, the um, clarification was issued yesterday. This includes, for example, aid to a manufacturer in GB, but with goods for sale in, in Northern Ireland, those rules will apply. Um, essentially across all the level playing field areas, if one side believes that the other has changed standards in a way that gives them competitive advantage, this gives them the right to use countermeasures or rebalancing measures. So temporary tariffs can be imposed. Um, and with all of these things, it's just worth recognizing that those tariffs, if they're applying between uh, the UK and the EU, that will have consequences for GB to, to NI. Um, after four years, if one party considers that there's too many breaches of level playing field matters, they can trigger a review of the whole trade agreement or just part of the trade agreement. And again, this will lead to uh, complications for Northern Ireland in its distinct position and place extra pressure on the protocol. So I'll leave it there and I'll, I'll hand over to David. Okay, thank you um, for the invitation to, to give evidence today. Um, not too much to, to add to what Katie has, has indicated there, um, but I would, would like to make a number of comments, mainly to do with the implementation of, of the protocol. But first off, just to um, really stress the thinness of the trade and cooperation agreement that has been concluded between the UK and the, the EU. Um, as, as Katie said, it's quite a, a, a unique um, uh, agreement because it's, it's, it's about creating frictions. It's about um, reducing the level of cooperation and integration between the UK and the, the EU. That said, I think it's important to stress that it does provide the basis for a relationship. So in that respect, it's welcome. We've avoided the, the, the no deal scenario, which was a distinct, a distinct possibility for much of 2020. Um, question is for the future, the extent to which the thinness is built on um, using the structures that they are created by the, the trading corporation um, to address some of the um, issues which are being increasingly picked up as people analyze the, the agreement and realize what is not in it, um, particularly around, say, services, around mutual recognition of professional qualifications, um, et, et cetera. Um, so I think this is where we are at the moment for the UK-EU relationship. Um, it would be interesting to see how that, that evolves in, in, the, in the future, although I would say well, the clear emphasis from the British government at the moment is that this is as far as the relationship goes um, and that, if, if anything, we're going to see probably um, further divergence um, in, in due course. Um, but if I could just make some comments about the, the, the um, agreements that were reached between the UK and the EU on the implementation of the protocol, because obviously they're of huge importance for us in Northern Ireland because uh, of the protocol fully taking effect from the 1st January this year. Um, as Katie has indicated, there's a number of important grace periods um, uh, agreed on the, on the initial implementation of the uh, elements of the, the protocol. Um, but I think the key point to make there is that they are temporary, um, essentially non-renewable, and that from the end of those grace periods, the obligations which the UK and the EU have entered into will apply. Um, and that needs to be prepared for. Um, I think it's also important to note that the decisions that were among the decisions that were made in December were um, important arrangements around um, permissible levels of uh, um, support for the fishing industry and for agriculture. Um, those those were agreed. Also, we've got arrangements um, for the regarding the rights and obligations of EU officials for monitoring the application of the protocol in in Northern Ireland. Um, important because one of the key 
challenges, I think, for the, for the years ahead is to rebuild trust between the UK and the EU in terms of the UK's commitment to meeting its obligations under both the withdrawal agreement and also the, um, uh, the, the new trade and cooperation uh, agreement. Um, as another point to make about the, um, the decisions in, in December is that there were some additions made to the annexes to the protocol. Um, this may seem mundane, and I don't think the, the issues which uh, were included there have really attracted much attention. Um, but the point to make here is that the protocol is dynamic, um, that we will see change coming through the protocol in terms of the legislation applicable in Northern Ireland um, uh, in order to um, avoid that hardening of the border um, north-south. Okay, so so there, there's a job to be done in the coming months and years is to ensure that we are fully aware of what is possibly going to be coming down the line, so that uh, the Northern Ireland voice can be inputted into the into available processes, such that uh, uh, the uh, there's a full understanding of uh, both the the what, what's it, what's in store, but also the, the way in which it's going to impact on on Northern Ireland. Okay. Um, a couple of other observations about what has been decided um, back in December. Um, as I said, great emphasis on um, eventual application of EU law at the end of the grace periods. Um, also, I think it's important to note that in the um, declarations that were made, the EU still reserved the right to initiate infringement proceedings if the UK is seen to be in breach of the, uh, its, its obligations. The, the point to make here is that um, Northern Ireland continues to be subject to the um, uh, jurisdiction of the Court of Justice in terms of the application of the EU law covered in by, by the protocol. Um, a further point is that even though there were some grace periods, um, there was no renegotiation of the protocol. Um, very much uh, sense that that is the set of arrangements that are applying those are the set of arrangements that have been agreed, and the emphasis now has to be on, on implementation. I think that was emphasized yesterday um, with the announcement that the Commission is disbanding the UK task force, which uh, negotiated the trade and cooperation agreement with the UK and has been responsible for in initially it's overseeing the implementation protocol and has replaced it with a, a service for the EU-UK agreement, which, and I quote, is there to support the efficient and rigorous implementation and working of the withdrawal agreement and, and therefore including the, the, the protocol. Um, so looking at the implementation from, from the EU side, the focus is very much on that implementation being um, undertaken and, and uh, it done so effectively. Um, and, and we shall see how that, that, that plays out um, in, in due course. Um, I suppose a final set of points relate to thinking through um, what might be happening in, in the future. Um, and it's to underline the fact that the protocol is um, not static. Um, there will be further changes um, coming forward. And what's important in this process is for there to be an awareness of what is going to be happening, but also that there's going to be opportunities for the Northern Ireland voice to be fed into the arrangements in place to, to, to manage that, that process and the decisions around it, um, particularly in terms of the Joint Committee, the Specialised Committee, and the still-to-be-formed Joint Consultative Working Group. Um, if, the, if the protocol is to be working effectively, is to minimise uh, disruption, then I think it's important that the Northern Ireland voice is heard in those arrangements. And uh, a key challenge ahead is to make sure that that, that voice is both formulated and, and then heard. Okay. So um, thanks for again for the invitation. Um, those are my initial set of comments. Um, thank you very much for that, both of you. It was really, really useful to get that um, overview of the, uh, the the TCA in general and, and it's, um, where it interfaces with the protocol and, and I suppose the, the initial um, rolling out of that that we have seen over the past couple of weeks. Um, I, obviously, there has been a, a focus on trade, I suppose, over, over these past few weeks and I suppose, as Katie, as you highlighted, um, that uh, some of this is entirely foreseeable in terms of, of the difficulties that we have seen um, in, in respect of that. And, and I think both of you highlighted that, you know, that this trade agreement has increased friction and, and reduced cooperation, and obviously there are implications of that. Um, there's a few things, I suppose, that I, I'd like to pick up on um, in relation to what is and isn't in the, the agreement. 
um, and what how it has impacted on what we're seeing so far. Um, and I suppose just one of the things that I'd, I'd like to pick up on, first of all, is around the, the trader support scheme that was supposed to be preparing um, businesses for, for trade um, post agreement. And obviously, as has been highlighted, the, uh, the TCA actually came very late and very little um, time for preparation. But in terms of that trader support service, how is that actually um, being effective or not effective at this point in time? And um, what more would need to be done in, in respect of, of that? Um, I'm happy to give. So in some ways, it's, it's early days yet for the Trader Support Service. Um, there was a, a little confusion, I think, for the first few months after it was announced about precisely what it would be able to do and intended to do. Um, and of course, as we all know, it didn't go live until the 21st of December, uh, which is very late in the day. Um, that said, I think the, the, the push on people registering for it, um, and particularly that message um, brought home here in Northern Ireland, uh, in time to make a difference um, when it came to um, enabling people to meet the requirements for goods moving GB to, to NI. And, um, I think from what I gather um, and uh, I, I think that the concern about it is that it's not at the moment, it's fairly standard responses and they're not able to give very detailed individual pieces of advice, for example, around some of the more complicated issues that are arising. Um, and I think that's probably quite foreseeable given the short period of time um, that everybody's had. Um, uh, and these, as I say, it's early days yet. Um, but by and large, it seems to be functioning okay. Okay. No, thanks for that. And I, I think, yeah, that that's, I suppose, um, it, it's familiar in terms of the feedback that, that we are getting in respect of it as well. Can I maybe ask, you see, in relation to the Joint Consultative Working Group, why has that not been set up yet? Why has it not been constituted? Um, obviously, <coughs> it's, a, it's um, a forum that, is, I suppose, is exactly designed to deal with what, what we're looking at now? Perhaps I could come in here. The, the um, Joint Committee, we understand, ha has signed off on the terms of reference for the Joint Consultative Working Group and the provisions in the um, protocol um, state that it will be meeting um, monthly. Um, I, I think we're at the stage yet where they're, they're, they're probably sort of still being consumed by the uh, uh, reaching agreement on the, the various decisions back before before December and putting in place the, the, the trade and cooperation agreement. The understanding is, yeah, that there is an intention to ensure that that um, joint consultative working group is up and running before, before too long, and I'd expect that to, to, to be the case. Um, it's just that we are in very much the early early months of the of, of the agreement, but as I say, the terms of reference have have been agreed. But uh, we're still to see, as, as you indicated, um, further detail about the, the composition and indeed the the schedule of meetings for this year. The same can be said about the the specialised committee. We, we don't know what schedule there will be for that. But I suppose one thing that was noted here by the joint co um, committee last um, December is that it is committed to meet four times this year quarterly. Um, whereas under the protocol, normal requirement is that it only meets annually. Okay. No, no, it's useful to know that in respect of the, the terms of reference that that is actually being signed off on at this point. Um, you, I think both of you mentioned about what isn't in the um, the agreement in terms of the, the, the things around um, the equivalence on SPS, the services is obviously one that's important across the island as well, and also um, MRPQ. So in terms of those things, um, can you maybe elaborate just a wee bit on those, um, the, the problems that there potentially is in respect of that? And obviously SPS is, is the one, I suppose, that is likely to be most visible most quickly, but those other things as well, um, there, I guess an opportunity was lost there in respect of the, the agreement in terms of, um, you know, making this a bit more frictionless, if that was at all possible. Um, so if, if you can maybe just speak to, the, to, to that, to those things. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, so again, this sort of reflects the 
priority of the UK to minimize those ties to the EU and to enable it to diverge. Um, and so we see that reflected in the nature of the deal and it specifically as it relates to SPS, which is of course the area of particular um, scrutiny and careful regulation, um, which comes into effect on the EU's external borders um, and which will also be um, implemented uh, with regards to the protocol of moving GB to NI. Um, I think we will uh, see the effect of this more if it is the case that the uh, uh, that any government indeed in Britain decides to diverge. So, um, uh, as we know from the, for the UK Internal Market Act, uh, that um, we, that if any part of um, GB decides to change its rules, and all of those goods have to be able to be in free circulation within. Um, uh, it within GB. Um, and so therefore, if we see a divergence in rules or a change of rules, for example, the use of pesticides or in relation to gene editing, for example, then that will have implications for what's allowed into uh, Northern Ireland. Um, but I would expect this to take place after a time when the protocol is sort of functioning relatively um, smoothly, speaking optimistically now, um, and, and that those um, processes for managing that will be in place um, and familiar with people. Um, on, the MR, on, the, on the mutual recognition of professional qualifications, I mean, this is an opportunity for the common travel area and the memorandum of understanding between uh, the UK and Ireland to really come into play here. So the, they recognize the potential for allowing um, uh, recognition of professional qualifications and, and doing something more formal on that in that memorandum of understanding. This is possible between the UK and Ireland and um, it arguably should be a priority now for the two governments to focus on. It's a complicated area. And as I say, you're talking about a range of uh, professions that would be affected and, and recognizing, of course, diversity even within the UK, uh, but it should be seen as um, necessary to address fairly quickly, um, at least as the first step to enabling um, smooth movement of services um, across the island. Could I just, just add, add one point um, to, to that, um, that uh, as Katie says, the, the CTA provides a, a framework in which to address um, certainly the, the mutual recognition of qualifications. Um, but also it's worth noting that when the European Union signed off on the withdrawal agreement, it adopted in its council decision um, arrangements which do allow for possibility for the, to ensure the proper functioning of, of the protocol for some bilateral agreements between um, Ireland and the, the UK. Um, what we don't know is what is really envisaged there in terms of potential, but I, I think it, it off, does offer one route to possibly addressing some of the perceived or actual shortcomings of the arrangements in, in, in place. And it may be that something, um, if, there, if there isn't a, a wish to address some, some of these issues on a more formal basis, that might be a route to, to be considering, at least exploring. No, no that's, that's useful. Um, no, thanks for that. That's something that obviously we'll, we as a committee will, will want to pick up on as well. Um, and I suppose just, I'm going to finish with this one for now. Um, I suppose last week it was reported in, I think, the Financial Times that there was um, moves by, by the British government to move around um, some of its work in workers' rights legislation. Um, and just in respect of that, obviously, there's the non-diminution principle in the protocol, um, which applies to specific rights. And, and then with employment rights, you know, that, that's a devolved area. So just uh, if you can maybe speak um, to, to those points in terms of what is actually covered by the, the protocol in terms of the non-diminution principle, and then um, what is the actual impact in terms of, of employment rights and what is covered in terms of the TCA? Um, I, can, I can make an attempt to answer this, although um, recognising I'm not an expert in, in rights by any means. Um, so the non-diminution principle it, it, in the protocol is um, about those rights as outlined in the um, Good Friday Belfast Agreement. Um, there is, uh, I guess, there's, there's various interpretations as to what that includes. Um, some say it should incorporate workers' rights. Um, others are um, uh, more cautious in relation to that. Um, but this is where the TTA comes in. 
So in relation to level playing field and labor standards, including workers' rights, is mentioned, you know, covered in the LP, LPS stuff. Um, and uh, both sides, I should say, in the TTA sort of recognize or stating that they don't um, have any plans to diminish uh, rights in these areas or standards in these areas. Um, uh, but now it is the fact that those that is covered by the TTA, and since you have that, you know, they're looking out for um, uh, for to prevent a situation in which one side lowers standards in such a way that gives um, the, the other uh, them competitive advantage over the other. Um, where this is where there's there's that potential for the whole of the UK EU relationship to be affected by that particular area. So, in some ways, it's as, as and it is a really important point that we do have this deal, so we do have that legal framework for the UK EU relationship, and it puts those concerns around workers' rights into that bigger picture with the overarching framework for dealing with that, including the, the um, countermeasures and rebalancing measures. And they, uh, then there's that twist in it, in that it could potentially have some impact, probably very minimal, but in theory, some impact on GB to NI movement given that you'd have addition of tariffs. Okay. Oh, thanks for that. And I, I think the, the specific concern that was being raised last week was around the work and time directive and, and that that is, I suppose, one that potentially has impact on, on trade and, and investment in terms of um, the, the differences that may manifest between um, the EU and Britain in, in respect of that. So I think it's one that's a, a watch and brief to, to an extent. Um, I'm just going to pass over to Stuart. First of all, can we bring Stuart into the spotlight, please? Oh no, Stuart Dixon. Sorry. Good morning. There he is. There he is. Thanks. Go ahead, Stuart. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry, apologies. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for for what you've been. Um, saying to us at the moment i've been reading some of the things that you you've been writing recently can i um just focus in for a moment on the subject of of article 16 and as you'll be aware there have been a number of um call political calls for it to be invoked to try and resolve um what i think most of the um transport people have actually, and logistics people and, and the supermarkets have actually been saying in the grand scheme of things have not been that difficult. It, it, food, food is getting through, nobody's starving in Northern Ireland, but there have been political calls to, to, to invoke uh, Article 16. Is it, is it fair to say that there's a perception that that would end the protocol? But in the reality, um, it wouldn't uh, at all. And in fact, if if it were to be invoked, uh, there would be a, an equal and opposite movement from the EU in, in respect of how that would actually uh, uh, impinge on us. What do you consider to be the, the level of the bar that would be necessary uh, to invoke or work uh, to, 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 get, to trigger Article 16? And... Um, how how do you see us resolving the issues um, that have uh, arisen so far uh, without the need to trigger Article 16? But it would be very helpful just to get your understanding and perception of the the two sides of Article 16 and what, and what people are calling for, what the actuality of, of, of that is. Um, just the other question I'd like to ask this morning as well it is in respect of the, the current grace period that we're in. Uh, and you you very ably set out in a, in a number of comments um, the, the lateness in the day of where we got to in the agreement at the end of December. Now, are we going to be in the same situation as we approach the end of the grace period or are, or are the governments and the, is the government and the EU uh, determined that the, that the period, the grace period that we're currently in will be used as a genuine working opportunity so that when the grace period ends, we will see a smoother uh, transition rather than a worse situation that we're in at the moment. Thank you. Um, shall I start on, on this one? On, on the grace periods, um, I think what's important to, to note with the, the three-month one ending in the end, end of March is it's actually been agreed by the, the UK that that is non-renewable. 
Okay, the focus is very much on providing um, additional time for those affected by the, the implementation to adjust so that there will be full implementation of the obligations from the, the um, date uh, on which the um, grace period I expires. Um, so I think that's a very, very clear um, focus of the, the, the arrangements. Um, so yes, additional time has been created in order to adapt to um, the requirements of, of the protocol. Uh, a reflection of the fact that probably things were possibly rushed um, late on, but uh, equally, I think a recognition that there was a lack of preparation um, un undertaken. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, that the lines are very clear from both the, the UK and the EU there that uh, the focus is on full implementation from the day after the grace period ends. Um, in, in terms of our Article 16, there's, there's a number of things that we can um, possibly comment on here. One is that uh, the, the Article 16 is very much a, a, a last resort mechanism uh, to be used when there are serious difficulties um, liable to, to persist. Um, now, there's, there's no strict definition of what classifies as serious or what is liable to persist, but I think it's worth noting that these clauses, so-called so safeguard clauses, are common in free trade agreements, but are rarely used. Um, the assumption being that you've got a framework in place which allows you, through normal means, to try and address the difficulties um, yeah. and identify what solutions there may be within the context of the obligations which both parties have entered into. Um, so I think, yeah, I can, I can understand why people might want to, to take radical action such as triggering Article 16, um, but I think it's also a point worth pointing uh, out there that it does not disapply the protocol. They are to be used in quite restricted, um, to, to, to deploy quite restricted and temporary measures. Okay. So I think the, the, before you get to the point where you would have Article 16 being contemplate or, or contemplating Art, Article 16 being triggered, um, I think you really do need to exhaust the existing means by which there is scope to potentially um, resolve the issues which are causing difficulties. That's very helpful. Thank you. Just to um, add to that, and I fully agree with everything David said. I mean, if, you, if you're reading Article 16, it's very clear it is about the enabling the continuity of the protocol, of the agreement, and so the measures to be taken um, uh, are meant to be agreed between the two sides, um, and they're meant to disrupt the functioning of the protocol as little as possible. Um, it's certainly not about overthrowing the protocol or seeing it come to an end. Um, but that said, it is a kind of nuclear option if you have a very similar thing to trigger, um, 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 especially if you decide to do so um, considering exceptional circumstances, i.e. without the three-month planning period, etc. Um, so it, it would uh, put things on a very, uh, you know, it would be very bad sign of the relationship between the UK and the EU if one side decides to take such unilateral measures. Um, uh, I, I should say that I think both the UK and the EU want the protocol to work. They both want, to, obviously, the TCA to work. Um, and so um, I, I have a, it's extremely unlikely that the UK would take that decision now to um, um, disrupt the protocol in such a way, which is only meant to be a last resort. Um, and just um, to follow up on that point around the grace period, um, again, I agree with what David said. Um, the UK and the EU want the protocol to work. Um, now, those the grace periods um, ending points are significant; they're not open for renegotiation, so we shouldn't expect to see any extension to those. That's not to say that they aren't very significant challenges, particularly the end of the three-month one. So, the first of April was a really critical time. Um, uh, there are things that have to be. Um, you know, there are adjustments to be made in relation to that. So. There, is, there will be um, you know, cost pressures, price pressures on companies trying to adjust to meet the, the requirements. So uh, the potential for the need for financial support in relation to that and meets the compliance costs. Um, there's also a need to adapt systems to be able to um, meet those challenges, which are very unusual. I, I can't stress enough how unusual the situation is. Uh, it's not, you know, these agreements aren't generally designed for trade that is, is integrated as it is. 
um, um, there are, you know, there's potential for the UK and EU to work out sort of pragmatic, practical ways to try and reduce the the burdens on businesses, recognising the unique situation of Northern Ireland. And as I say, if they want the protocol to work, they, they have scope to do that. Um, and and uh, then finally, we will see an adjustment or, re or reorientation of business. Um, so there will be more local sourcing, for example, of, of produce. That's just a natural thing to do um, in order to try and maintain supply um, and keep costs as, as low as possible. And so we will see businesses adjusting. Um, that, and that's not to say that it isn't a very significant um, adjustment to be made in some cases, but um, fundamental to it all is this idea that the protocol has to work in a way that causes minimal disruption. Thank you. Can you just very briefly, Chair, move on to one final question? Um, and I'm not sure whether this is an area that you have a particular um, a comment to make on the European health insurance um, situation. The UK government has uh, replaced that with what they describe as a global health card. Yet they've excluded some of the former or the non E. EEA countries uh, from uh, the global health card. I think notably Switzerland, Norway um, are excluded from it. Are, are you aware of what, and I appreciate very few people are actually traveling at the moment, and, and I guess travel insurance is, is, is not high on people's priorities, but it will become uh, as uh, hopefully the vaccine rolls out and time progresses. Are we aware of, at this stage, is there any comparison between the, the benefits of the former EHIC card and the new global health card? And also, as you appreciate, the Irish government uh, did introduce legislation before Christmas. I, it looks as if, in large part, the legislation which they introduced to allow Northern Ireland citizens to have access to the EHIC card through there. Uh, uh, through their membership of the EU um, is now largely redundant, or is that a fair comment to make? So I, I can't really co comment on that. I don't know this um, sufficient detail around um, the, 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 the comparison between the EAC and the, the Global Health Card, unfortunately. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry, I wouldn't be able to um, add anything either. Sorry, Stuart. Yeah. Uh, in, in that instance, I, I, I'll refer that question to the chair and suggest that perhaps as it can be that scenario we might want to look at. I appreciate it's probably more health orientated, but it also relates to travel, uh, which is an area which we do have an interest in. Thank yeah. you. I think specifically tourism so is something that we, 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 will, we will pick up with the department. And if I could just ask one question around Article 16, if um, looking at Annex 7 of the protocol, which um, is it's how Article 16 is applied. It's very much about resolving the issues that would cause Article 16 to be implemented in the first place. So the notion that it would do away with the protocol is not really, it doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. No, it's, it's no, absolutely. I mean, it is part of the protocol as, as these things are part of every agreement in the interest of um, enabling the longevity of that agreement and for it to um, work properly without causing undue harm. Thank you. Um, can we bring Gary into the spotlight, please? Thanks, Chair, uh, and thanks to Katie and David for uh, their contributions. I find it very useful. Um, I suppose my first question is around some of the correspondence that we received in our packs today from the uh, the uh, Minister of State, Robin Walker, he, he had said in his correspondence that you, uh, where TV problems have arisen, uh, they're often related to the wider COVID response. Uh, it was just to get, I suppose, the view of the, the, yourselves in relation to how much of this do you put down to the COVID response or uh, like ourselves as active reps, obviously we're hearing of issues, uh, whether it be car steam or the haulage industry. Is it fair to say that the majority of that is down to COVID? Or uh, is, is it into the issues around um, the protocol itself? Um, so again, I mean, I'm not speaking as a business person, but as somebody who's, who's liaised closely with business on this, I mean, 
yes, COVID is a very significant factor. So, um, of course, we saw the shutdown of the UK um, EU border um, just before Christmas, and that has had knock on effects. Um, not not least in getting goods into Northern Ireland in that first week after Christmas and, and, and first week of the new year. Um, and so by the time, bearing in mind, you know, the delays that were then entailed and that uh, the knock on effects on shelf life, for example. So we, we definitely saw the impact of that. Um, COVID has had a wide range of impacts, even in terms of uh, the nature of supplies in, in supermarkets and the kind of demands that there are. So um, there was a little bit of increased purchasing of certain products. Um, and that also had an effect. Um, but I think, you know, so I, definitely COVID is a very significant factor. Um, but there are other factors, of course, um, that are um, shaping things. In a, and the, the protocol is very much one of those, as is the TCA. Um, so two big things are, of course, the, the just I think the realities of, of the of the protocol and of the TCA. I mean, the realities of the hugely significant change to the relationship between the UK and the EU, and um, indeed the movement of goods between GB and I. I mean, that's just going to take time for people to come to terms with or to adjust to, um, and. Uh, we have seen that somewhat in the movement of goods from GB to NI, uh, not just in sort of a lack of preparation, but also in, in the reduced flow. Um, that's partly, again, COVID related, but partly people just holding back at this time, sort of waiting to see how things settle. Um, and then um, the other factor, of course, was, as David has already mentioned, that the, the, the last minute nature of the decisions, um, information, around what was necessary to um, move goods from GB to NI very late in the day. Um, those decisions from uh, the Joint Committee not confirmed until 17th of December. And then, of course, you know, very major schemes like the UK Trader Scheme, the Movement Assistance Scheme, really being developed over, over the Christmas period. I mean, it's extraordinary, really. Um, so all of that has had an effect. And uh, I, I would expect that we will continue to see disruption um, because of the nature of the significance of that adjustment. Um, uh, but fundamentally, I mean, it is it is very good that we do have that UKU deal. Things would be much more serious without it. And uh, uh, when we see, I mean, there are several things in the protocol and in the implementation of the protocol that are still to be properly worked out. So even if we're looking at um, NI to GB movement, um, we, it's clear that the arrangements for that are in phase one and they will have to be adjusted a little bit down the line to prevent exploitation of that unfettered access. So I, I think business um, can expect to see continued disruption and change for the coming year, um, uh, just as um, across the board, UK, EU, and including in Ireland, that we're just um, having to adapt to this very new environment. Thanks for that, Kitty. David, did you want to say something there? Or you... I think uh, the, the, the only thing I, I, I'd add to that is I, I think we, we sometimes for, for, um, forget that the end of the transition period was going to involve disruption because if you're removing yourself from a customs union relationship with a, or your major trading partner and you're coming out of the regulatory alignment framework provided by the single market, that is going to cause disruption. Um, now, it's very difficult to actually quantify the extent to which the disruption that we've seen is due to the end of the transition period, the adaptation to the trade and cooperation agreement, the adaptation to the protocol, the lack of preparation, the lack of information, um, the, the, the late delivery of the, of the new services. Um, but COVID will have had an impact, but it would be inappropriate to blame it all on COVID. Uh, there's a whole array of issues here at, at, at play. Thanks for that, uh, Katie and David. And, and uh, you know, it's obvious that there's a number of factors, and I do take your point. I think it would be inappropriate to, to blame it fully on COVID. Uh, it is unfortunate that there's a number of storms, if you like, uh, happening at one time. Um, in, in a survey that, well, again, we were dealing with this today in terms of the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce, uh, they had said, they'd done a survey of, of businesses in Northern Ireland, and 51% of them said that they were worried about uh, GB. 
uh, customer attitudes to Northern Ireland businesses. And, and I know, Katie, in your contribution, you'd mentioned in terms of, uh, I suppose, the GB to NIE trade. Uh, obviously, there was a role to play, and, and given the, the tight nature of uh, discussions, there was limited time. But in terms of preparing GB businesses for what were effectively and what are effectively new rules, if you flip that in the head and you say that with the position that Northern Ireland is currently in, how aware do you think are businesses of the position that Northern Ireland's in in terms of access to both the UK and EU markets? And do you, you know, how do you feel that presents as an opportunity, if you like, to Northern Ireland uh, going forward? I, I know it's, we're, we're talking about this in the context of a, a very disruptive uh, period, just in time. but do you see a swing, if you like, in terms of that, um, that, that, that discussion point? Yeah, so uh, I think, so awareness of Northern Ireland's distinct position um, is relatively low in GB, and I, I think it's also lower than um, we might have expected or hoped in Ireland and the rest of the EU as well. Um, so it will take some time uh, before, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the consequences of the protocol um, uh, are fully realised. Uh, the fact that Northern Ireland is still in the single market for goods and the opportunities that that means um, for Northern Ireland to be fully realised and secured. Um, but yeah, Northern Ireland is in a in an interesting position because we have the um, commitment on the UK side that goods in Northern Ireland can circulate freely, have full market access to GB. Now that's not to say that there won't be difficulties, I think, in some specific areas. Um, but principally, that idea that um, goods that are certified in Northern Ireland will automatically be able to be sold in GB gives, gives us a strong advantage there. Um, so you could see over time, potentially, that um, people would recognise the benefits of they wanting to access the GB market um, uh, in an unprecedented way, um, particularly in highly regulated areas. Um, as well as um, have access to the single market for goods in the in the EU, then Northern Ireland would be an attractive place. Um, this would have to um, be something that would be um, fully supported and enabled, not just by the Northern Ireland executive, but also, of course, by by the UK government as well and, and the EU um, too. So, but longer term, you could see how there would be some benefits for Northern Ireland in that distinct position. Um, if this thing beds down in a way that is, as I say, causes minimal disruption and, and the and the unique position of Northern Ireland is recognised both in GB and the EU. Thank I think, you. I, I'd agree with um, Katie on that. I think one of the one of the big challenges is to make sure that potential um, investors and um, those who trade with Northern Ireland are actually fully aware of what the arrangements are. Um, I think there's been a tendency to hide um, the particular position of, of Northern Ireland um, in recent uh, months. Um, and also, I think we, we do need to be critical of the UK government in terms of the, the, the lack of information which was provided, um, particularly for um, GB suppliers. For, 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 for in terms of moving goods from Northern Ireland, one would sincerely hope that once there's greater familiarity with the arrangements, then um, the, the the cost of adaptation um, will, will be will be lower, um, and people will in in due course um, adapt to the, the the new the new circumstances. Um, but I think a key lesson to be to be learned here is that uh, we we need to be open about what the arrangements are, um, and make sure that they are fully understood. And I think there is a tendency at the moment to focus particularly on um, the situation in GB, understandably because of the importance of it in, in trade terms for Northern Ireland. But I also think there needs to be an understanding within the EU and its member states about the particular position of, of Northern Ireland, that when you talk about the movement of goods from, say, Germany into the, the UK, there's different arrangements if those goods are moving Germany to Northern Ireland. And equally, the investment opportunities that um, Northern Ireland provides are different because of its access to both markets compared to those which would exist with it within GB. Thanks for that. Thanks, Chair. Guy, can you bring Sinead into the spotlight, please?
Can we bring Sinead McLaughlin into the spotlight, please? Oh, there we go. Sorry, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep, we can. Okay. So, um, sorry about that. Um, I, someone knocked at my door. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Katie uh, and David, for um, your insight um, this morning. Um, uh, as always, you, you make difficult situations um, much clearer. But the truth is, uh, you know, business is experiencing difficulties and challenges at the moment. It is more difficult to do business. The truth is that there are more barriers and the truth is that there is more disruption. But we have to get into solution mode and solving these problems at the minute. We can't just keep on screaming uh, uh, about it. And I think that there's too much of that going on within the context of politics here in Northern Ireland, a bit of point scoring. And I think that, you know, the last contribution that, that, that David spoke about is we have to find where um, there are opportunities here uh, and what are distinct um, offering is within Northern Ireland and speak to that and I think that that's really important going, going uh, forward uh, for all of us but I, I was wondering have you any clarity uh, in relation to what criteria there is for goods um, that are determined now at risk particularly those goods going forward to transportation in the Republic of Ireland Um, so an important part of the joint committee decisions that we had mid-December was to manage that question of at risk. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a really, really, really critical, um, particularly given at the time we didn't know there would be a UK EU deal. Um, the challenge is reduced somewhat by the fact that we do have that deal. Um, um, so the UK trader scheme is a really important element in um, helping manage that situation. At, at the moment, of course, it relies on um, businesses signing up to the scheme um, being sort of self-preparing, if you like, that their goods aren't at risk of going into the EU if they're coming from GB. Um, at some point, um, those claims have to be checked, and there have to be some means of ver you know verification to prove that 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 is the case. Um, so we don't. We don't really, we don't yet know the details of that, like how what requirements will be for proving this, um, or what will happen if, um, in the bad situation in which a company is found to um, have not met the criteria um, to prove that those goods aren't at risk. So this is a sort of one of the one of the nitty gritty problems that I think will be um, potentially faced by business, and that um, it's one of the areas that. HMRC and others will have to issue clarification on and assurance to business, I think, um, with regards to um, uh, that UK trader scheme and uh, uh, yeah, how, how it will operate in the, in the long run in a sort of more formalised, established way. And Katie, you mentioned there in your presentation about the protocol being very dynamic. Can you, can you speak a little bit more about that, uh, that situation going forward? Yeah, so there's, um, if in Annex 2 of the protocol, there's a vast range of legislation, the EU uh, that continues to apply in Northern Ireland. Now, of course, that's been applying across the UK through EU membership, and it's um, sort of been written into to UK so far, and then we may see divergence in the future. So that will continue to apply in Northern Ireland, and if, if, if those particular... Um, uh, legislative instruments are um, amended or updated, then those amendments and updates will automatically apply in Northern Ireland. Um, so there is a there is an issue, as David sort of hinted at, there is an issue here in Northern Ireland how we keep an eye on that, how we know what is being updated. Formally, we should be notified um, through the Joint Committee. Uh, well, the UK should be notified. Um, but the, the, the point is that those are automatically applying here in, in Northern Ireland. Um, another element to it is that if the EU thinks that there is an aspect of um, it's actually a new um, piece of um, new directive, for example, regulation that will come in that it thinks should apply to Northern Ireland, I, about its single market for goods in particular, um, then it will um, make that clear to the, to the UK. And in theory, they're meant to agree on that 
been incorporated into the protocol, as David mentioned, that the annex was updated even already. Um, uh, in, in terms of what applies in Northern Ireland, if there's disagreement on that, then we could see um, uh, potential need for um, resolution, potential um, countermeasures being taken by the EU. Um, that's in a very that would be a worrying scenario, but essentially the principle is that Northern Ireland remains dynamically aligned because what's updated in the EU will automatically apply to Northern Ireland. Um, and this is the case, of course, in the EEA. David knows much more about this than I do. Um, but they have they have the formalised institution for making sure that they know exactly what's being updated and are able to comply with that. Northern Ireland's distinct position means that we have, and it's small because the fact that it's so small, it, it doesn't have particular challenges, I think, um, in in uh, uh, in adjusting to the, the sort of um, dynamic nature of the protocol and, and most particularly in the UK, Westminster sort of recognising Northern Ireland's very distinct position and allowing for that, particularly in the development of the UK internal market. And then the, the other, I suppose, that really speaks to that as well, is um, in, in relation to the reorientation of business within, uh, within Northern Ireland as a result of that. Um, and how do you see that, that that can take place or that will take place over time? Um, so there is, so as I say, there's, there's potential for making the most of unfettered access from NI into GB. Um, and there's also uh, the potential for making the most of Northern Ireland's free access to the, for, to the EU's single market. So in some ways, it's in a very distinct position because it has access to all of, all of GB market, plus also all of the EU's single market, um, which is extraordinary. Um, so um, hopefully, uh, when say when things are stabilised and people are clear about not just about the rules but are familiar with them and it becomes part of their operation, uh, then there is potential to make the most of of that fact that Northern Ireland is in that distinct position. Um, uh, whether you know what that means in practice is is uh, you know. It, 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 there's, there's the all, all island economy can be made the most of, um, but also, as I say, this is all of the EU that we're talking about. Um, for that to be exploited to full potential, we'll need to see um, a settling down of uh, the way that goods are moved between uh, the UK and the EU, particularly across, the, across that land bridge. Um, and I suspect, you know, the fact that Northern Ireland, if it has direct movement into to the EU, um, is in a really strong position. We'll probably see more more um, use of those direct routes in the future away from the UK land bridge. Yeah, I suppose maybe even um, looking at the context of an all island economy, looking at supply chains closer to home, in order to maximise the opportunity um, uh, and uh, and less uh, barriers as well. Okay, thank you very much, Katie uh, and David. Uh, your your contributions are always very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Can we bring John Stewart into the spotlight, please? John's still on mute, is he not? Yep, there we go. Hi, David, Katie, can you hear me okay? Yeah. No. Yeah, thanks again um, for your presentation. Very informative and helpful as, as always. Uh, I just want to pick up on, um, most of my points have been covered, um, but Following on from, from Gary's point about maybe the attitude of some of the British government ministers around this, Brandon Lewis said yesterday, reaffirmed the posi their position that there is no border in any shape or form down the Irish Sea, that there are no problems with supply chains, that these are just hiccups um, and pivoted towards the problems around COVID. I mean, is he completely detached from reality, given what what we're hearing from supply chains and the haulage industries about the problems that we're encountering here uh, and do you think it's quite worrying that the British government are, are either blissfully unaware or unable to acknowledge that there are problems with the implementation of the protocol and, and, and the difficulties that we're seeing? I think th th there are concerns that I would have about the um, UK government's uh, willingness to acknowledge the level of disruption that the end of the transition period was going to cause. 
I'll get back to a point I made earlier. If you're coming out of the single market, if you're coming out of the um, customs union, then this is going to see the introduction of the increased formalities, checks and controls, and that is going to lead to disruption. And I think anybody who's been following closely the, the, the process of the UK's withdrawal from the EU and the negotiations on the trade and cooperation agreement um, knew this was going to be the case. And I would say if, if government ministers aren't willing to acknowledge the extent to which the disruption was going to, to ensue, then that is a problem. Yeah, agreed. Um, okay, yeah, I uh, totally agree with you on that. Uh, I don't unfortunately see any any change in attitude so far. And hopefully, um, you know, the noise that's been made the business will be picked up by those government ministers and they'll actually start to realise that there are issues. Um, one of the consistent messages we're getting from business um, across all sectors is that call for an extension of the grace period. And I know, David, you said that the British government has already agreed that the three months would be finite. But what would be the process if there was broad agreement that things weren't quite working to plan and, you know, difficulties continued to be presented, um, how that grace period could be extended? Would that be through the joint consultative working group or through another mechanism? The, the, the obvious mechanisms will be those provided for in the in the protocol. So you've got the joint committee, which we know is going to be meet, meeting quarterly. But before that, the role of the specialised committee is to identify the, the difficulties which implementation of the protocol may be, may be causing. So there's a formal route there. Um, once the joint consultative working group is is up and running, that provides an another, another mechanism in which the um, issues around implementation can, can be discussed. So those are the formal mechanisms. I think what we um, are obviously aware of is that okay, as part of any relationship that any state has with the EU, officials are in touch. So that there will be um, identification of, of, of issues. Um, and means of, of communicating those. I also think we've got to be, uh, we, we should be aware of that the, the EU does have um, officials already based in, in Northern Ireland overseeing the implementation of, of the uh, Union Customs Code, uh, for example, and some of the SBS checks. I think, um, whereas I know there are uh, concerns about having such uh, people present, they do provide a valuable means of actually getting an EU understanding of the situation on the ground. Um, and I, I think that there's, I'm sure those mechanisms are, are going to be used. So I don't think it's the case that uh, the EU won't be aware of the issues, the British government won't be aware of the issues, um, but, uh, but there are mechanisms in which these, these can be discussed and then at least then formally um, considered, whether that will actually bring uh, a change in the uh, position such whereby the grace periods will not be extended, that's the, the current understanding at the moment, that is open, open to question. Um, I'm, personally, I, I, I think the EU has been quite clear that the protocol was coming into a, a force on the 1st first, first of January. It identified that there were a number of issues where the UK was ex anticipating or knew there was going to be um, difficulties. Agreements were reached between, between the two, two sides um, and grace periods agreed. Always, however, on the understanding that the obligations which both sides entered into in the withdrawal agreement would be fully implemented from the end of those grace periods. Okay, thanks for that. Um, another aspect we're seeing is the amount of businesses in um, GB and um, big internet firms, for example, that are putting Northern Ireland on the lepers list of not able to receive those goods, or if they are receiving, they're at drastically higher shipping rates. Do you think that's something that's going to increase over time, or is this? A teething problem for the better term in terms of businesses over there not really understanding how the mechanisms currently work when shipping goods to GB or to Northern Ireland, sorry, because it's something I'm sure all of us are getting from people is that things that were, were readily available um, are now just on a list of unable to receive, and, uh, and, uh, and it is worrying that that's increasing on a daily basis. I mean, this was something we got the information about this on New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. around our stores and delivery from DB to NI. So um, it's unsurprising that um, companies just erred, erred on the side of caution. They didn't want to be breaking the law or not compliant with the law uh, when it came to what was needed to move goods, oh, sorry, parcels from GB to NI. And so um, they held off in doing so and promising delivery. Um, and also everything else that was going on um, at the end of um, the transition period, including as I say, the knock-on effects of, of um, the shutdown of the GDU order, et cetera. 
Um, I, I think we'll, we'll, we are already seeing an easing of that um, in some cases, um, uh, but we are very conscious that that um, provision in relation to parcel movement um, uh, and provision of goods to individual consumers is just a temporary one. Um, and that that is something that has to be agreed um, before the end of March. And that will be a difficult one, I think. Um, and there's the difference between business to business and then business to consumer. Um, again, hopefully, um, the distinct position of the protocol, uh, the distinct position of Northern Ireland, I mean, it's not the same as GB to BU on all fronts. And this is one area where you can be clearly made because it's very clear that obviously the, the good in question isn't isn't at risk you know there is an end point clear end point yeah. that that hopefully that some um provision can be made for recognizing that and enabling that to be addressed in a, in a reasonable way but I, I would expect to see more disruption on that um uh, particularly you know before the end of march it's definitely one to keep an eye on okay um, the last point I have, Chair, um, and thanks for your indulgence, is um, certain specific problems. For example, um, a, a big pet wholesaler come to me last week just to say that products like frozen pet food, for example, are now just not allowed to come in to Northern Ireland because the EU have said that that's not something that, that, that they're willing to sign off on through veterinary certificates and things. At what stage do these products that over time they're starting to see a lot of problems are those going to be ironed out and what is the mechanism for starting to to, to find these products and to, to just flag them up and get a solution to them so that we can have them here in Northern Ireland? Um, so fundamentally uh, there's uh, you know that there are there are rules that apply on goods moving into, into the EU single market um and there will be some and i mentioned sausages for example do you know the moment we have that grace period on, on those kind of products but that's not that it does have an end point and that will be hard end and after that point you won't be able to bring those goods in um and i think we have seen some cases such as your um uh, your constituent there who's sort of uh th things that maybe weren't considered or recognized and i think this is part of the complication of the fact that you know deals of this nature are just it's just so unusual to be uh, allowing for divergence and disintegration if you like in relation to markets rather than integration of them it's, it's just reversing <laughs> the the instincts and the, and the trends so um we will see the challenges I, I mean it would be wrong of me to suggest that we'll necessarily use solution to these that will allow for exceptions um because the eu is you know is very rigorous about protecting the single market particularly when it comes to sps um mm -hmm. and there is a reason for this um but unfortunately it does entail big disruption um and this is why the you know, the voice of business being heard in particular around meeting the cost of compliance or the cost of adjustment um and the you know the disruption that that brings particularly in the short term you know, that voice needs to be heard very loud and clear. Okay. Thanks, Kitty. Thanks, David. I appreciate your time today. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. John. Can we bring John or Dowd into the spotlight, please? Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, David and Kitty, for, as always, a very informative briefing on a very complex issue. I, I want to return to the issue of reorientation, not only of supply chains, but also of economic strategy. Uh, given that we are now in a new economic reality, it, it would strike me that uh, it would, the department will have to reorientate its economic strategy to take into account that new economic reality. Uh, and though those goods that are now having difficulties for whatever reason coming from Britain directly, suppliers are going to have to find them elsewhere. So. Uh, is there a need for that reorientation of the economic strategy, not only in terms of north, south, but east, west, but also the point Katie mentioned earlier, I don't wish to put words in her mouth, but it would appear that the department should now be tasking InvestNI to be going uh, into the EU in terms of the European continent 
and selling the north as a unique place to invest uh, and, and reap the benefits uh, as limited as they are of, of the protocol uh, and try and have a strategy which mitigates against the worst impacts of Brexit in terms of our economic well-being. Um, so, yes, that would be, I mean, you could see how that would be um, something that Invest and I could consider, most definitely because they're at Northern Ireland's different position, particularly with unfettered access into GB and the EU single market that does bring potential benefits. Um, I should say, I mean, the EU will be keeping an eye on on this, this is UK will, and uh, so it won't want a situation in which uh, you know, the companies start relocating into into Northern Ireland in a way that suggests to them that there's a problem, you know, or some sort of exploitation of a loophole. Similarly, similarly the UK won't want it either, but, you know, if it's too dramatic, but most certainly, uh, you know, um, this is a rich diversion of trade, but if, if you have, um, you know, Northern Ireland's position, it has to, it can't be a situation where it's on the hard edge of of both that it actually does bring benefits this unique position does bring benefits um and this is why it needs to be carefully managed with northern ireland's voice particularly but not exclusively as business voice is kind of recognized um and uh, and the and the potential to make the most of that unique position um and for investment to to, to follow that would would be a really important matter also bearing in mind, and one thing to keep an eye on, which is a challenge, is Northern Ireland's position vis-a-vis -vis the EU and the UK FTAs. Um, that is an issue that still needs to be resolved. Um, and uh, the EU wasn't willing to really consider it in much detail because it has to be member state by member state basis. Sorry, um, an FTA by FTA basis. But this is something that, again, um, would be worth keeping an eye on because that has wider benefits for Northern Ireland's trading position or potential benefits for Northern Ireland's trading position when it comes to a sort of international trade so that Northern Ireland can benefit from EU FTAs as well as UK FTAs. I think if I could add to that, if we look at the last um, four years since the um, referendum, there's been a, a distinct uncertainty around the nature of the UK's trading relationship with the EU and indeed the rest of the world. Um, what we have now with the protocol and with the TCA is a degree of certainty which has been missing to date. So it's been actually quite difficult to, uh, to develop strategy in some respects. So I would have thought here is an opportunity to, whether it's a reorientation of strategy or it's re uh, more a revisiting of strategy to take into, con into consideration the new realities, I think that is something which does need to be done. Um, I think um, also picking up on Katie's point about the access to EU trade agreements, um, I wouldn't blindly um, use the best of both worlds um, uh, language, which does seem to be being deployed by, by some politicians around, because we are a long way short of that, because there are shortcomings in, in, in the protocol, and probably more work does need to be done to secure the level of um, or to maximise that sense of, of, of best of both, both worlds um, for, for Northern Ireland. And I think one of the key issues there is going to be the question of access to um, the, the terms of EU trade agreements with, with third countries. Um, that's not just in terms of exports, but also in terms of imports. And we're already seeing that um, in, in, in some cases, um, that lack of access um, impacting on, on, on business. So I think that there, there is an argument to say well, there is definitely an argument to say that uh, the new realities which have been created by the existence of the TCA and now the implementation of, of, of the protocol in the context of the TCA do need to be reflected in any strategies any department is, is developing. Um, and that would go not just for um, the departments here, but I also think in, in London as well. London has a degree of responsibility to ensure that the particular arrangements for Northern Ireland are made clear to um, uh, potential uh, investors. Um, in 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 the UK, um, and they, they they need to be need to be clear about that. Well, um, I don't expect you to comment on this. Uh, I don't believe for one second that London will reflect that to to, to businesses or, or to the EU, because it's not in their advantage. Uh, we have to rely on our own Department of Economy to do that. But in terms of of short term or maybe short to medium term, 
vehicles such as Intertrade Ireland, are, are they, is there an opportunity there for businesses or for investment in Intertrade Ireland, which in turn will allow uh, investment in businesses to reorientate their trading relationships across the island of Ireland? Because businesses, by the way, I think the NISA report has shown that more small and medium enterprises are now operating north-south. Some businesses will have no recognition or familiarity with north-south relationships and would need support to do that. Yeah, I mean, Intertrade Ireland has played an important part in helping people prepare for the end of the transition period, um, you know, um, advising around customs adjustment, etc. There's definitely still work to be done on familiarising businesses, particularly in the south, about Northern Ireland's distinct position. Um, uh, uh, that's quite clear, and I think it's particularly true amongst smaller businesses that um, it, it is hard for people to get their heads around, you know, that they're tending to think of the UK being outside of the EU and Northern Ireland's distinct position in the C single market for goods. You know, it's an unusual arrangement. So I think first and foremost, that would be, that should definitely be a priority for bodies like Intertrade um, to make sure that that distinct position is recognised by businesses of all types and then to begin to think about how to um, invest as is as it's its remit to enable um, north south trade and you know just to facilitate facilitate growth in that area that's that's what it's there to do in many ways okay thank you chair thank you david get it okay thank you for that um david and kitty i just have one final thing that i wanted to ask about um and you've mentioned in in the presentation around um one of the strands being governance of the tca um there's a number of committees um there's the partnership council and then a number of specialized committees that have been established and obviously that the north has i suppose a unique position in terms of the protocol and how um certain aspects of eu law continue to apply here and um, just in terms of the oversight of the TCA and the involvement of um, representation from the North and the institutions here, how, how do you see that um, continuing in, in terms of the new arrangements? And I assume these new, the new council and the new committees don't actually be established until the, the EU actually ratifies the, the agreement. Is, is that correct? Or will there be some provisional... Um, set up of those bodies in the interim? Yeah, the provisional application of the agreement involves the institutions. Um, so even if there is a delay to the EU's um, uh, 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 final approval of, of the agreement, then those institutions can, can still meet. Um, I think that there is a major challenge here because I think the UK government will view the various um, UK EU committees as being the responsibility, obviously, of the UK government addressing UK um, concerns. Um, but what's going to be really important in the operation of the TCA is consideration of the implications for the operation of the protocol and therefore Northern Ireland's position. Um, and it's obviously a very uh, political issue for the UK government to, to determine how it's actually going to formulate its position within those uh, 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 bodies. Um, by bringing in or not the position of the, the devolved administrations, um, because there is an argument quite clearly to having um, some formal consultation of, of Northern Ireland because of the implications of what happens in the TCA for, for the protocol. But the politics uh, around that um, are obviously very difficult in the UK context because that would require you essentially to, to ensure that there's effective consultation of Scotland and, and Wales. I suppose one of the disappointing things about the, the last four years has been the um, limited engagement or limited effective engagement um, by uh, government departments in, in the UK with the devolved administrations to ensure that, the, uh, that they are fully informed of and um, have opportunities to, to engage in the, the, the work or, 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 the, or the, the work of the teams involved in, in, the, in the negotiations. Um, one would hope that that would uh, be uh, remedied in the implementation of arrangements for the governance of, of, of the TCA. But as yet, we, we haven't seen what that arrangement um, is going to be. Um, if there are arrangements put in place, then that then requires um, Northern Ireland to identify what its position is. And I think this is going to be a, a major challenge because 
the TCA covers, despite its thinness, covers a huge range of issues. And there must be questions about uh, resourcing and capacity within Northern Ireland to do, to do the level of monitoring and engagement um, that we would necessarily want to see in order to ensure that the interests are, are, are represented. Um, but that, that there, is an, that there is, is an important issue there. And I think it would be, we look forward to getting some clarity from the UK government as the, to the extent to which it is going to involve the devolved administrations, um, and particularly Northern Ireland, in the operation of the governance arrangements for, for, for the TCA. Um, um, so that it, that, uh, the, the, that it does work for the interests of, of uh, Northern Ireland as well as the rest of the UK. And in, I suppose just then a, a final question around that. Um, in relation to the where those bodies, those committees might interface with the, the joint committee and the specialised committee, um, is there an overarching piece in respect of that? No, they're, they're technically separate. Um, that you've got the, the um, joint committee, the specialised committees, and the uh, joint consultative working group are set up by the, the withdrawal agreement and, and the protocol. Um, and I'm not aware of there being any formal linkages between the two, or indeed any consideration being given as to how, how the two will interrelate in the in the arrangements for implementation of the um, TCA and of, of the protocol. In your view, is, is there an, a, a, perhaps a need for, for there to be some sort of interface there? I think there is, because clearly the, the um, development of uh, the TCA, its implementation, uh, has implications for the operation of the, the protocol and for Northern Ireland's um, position, particularly in, in trade terms with, with the, the EU. Um, so that, that there does need to be um, some, some, some sort of joined up thinking about how both of them are, are operating and how, how they interconnect. Um, and I think, okay, that can be left to the government, but I think there's also an important role there for those bodies that are scrutinising both the TCA and the um, protocol. Um, you can't take scrutiny of the protocol on its own. It needs to be put in the context of the broader scrutiny of the UK-EU relationship, of which the implementation of the Pro Northern Ireland Protocol is, is part. Oh, that, that's very useful. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, go ahead, Christopher. Sorry. Um, uh, thank you for your presentation thus far. It's been really, really interesting. And um, as always, uh, always good to hear from you. Um, I just want to ask sort of, I suppose a direct question and a, a quite a political one, but uh, is Edmund Pooch right when he said that the Emperor has no clothes? When the Secretary of State claims to us that there is no friction in terms of trade east-west, when it's quite apparent that that is, that is presently what is happening. So, I mean, what's your assessment? Who's right? Is the Secretary of State right or is Edmund Pooch right? <laughs> I think, as I said, as I said earlier, I, I think if, if the UK um, is leaving the customs union and single market of the European um, Union, there will be friction on movement of goods between the UK and the, the EU. Once you put in place the protocol where effectively Northern Ireland is in the customs territory of the European Union and also in its single market for goods, there was bound to be friction so it's, on that border. Yes, and so uh, for, the, for the government, for the Northern Ireland office mm -hmm. and their representative, the Secretary of State, to persist in this repeated denial of what we all can see happening, I think tests credibility to destruction. Would you agree with me on that? <laughs> it's definitely, um, it is very unhelpful because um, of the need for GB businesses in particular to be aware of Northern Ireland's position. Mm. So it's just a contradictory, you know, if you're wanting to facilitate movement of goods, GB to NI, then businesses need to know what's necessary. And that there is, there is a very particular um, set of new rules and procedures that businesses have to comply with to get goods from GB into Northern Ireland. Mm. Um, and the UK government has a responsibility to make that absolutely clear and to facilitate that as best as possible. And it has done many things to do that, move assistance scheme, UK trader scheme, et cetera, et cetera. But fundamentally, businesses need to know that there's been a change. Um, and, uh, this, and this is why I would say it is it is unhelpful to confuse people simply um, by on the one hand saying, you know, 
you know, this is necessary to get across. On the other hand, saying there's been there's no friction there. Yeah. Um, in terms of obviously later today, a, a new administration takes over in <coughs> excuse me takes over in uh, the United States of America, and obviously uh, there would be a hope uh, over the coming period of time that there will be a, a UK USA trade agreement at some point. The practical outworking of the arrangements that have now been put in place, will the reality be that it will, it will be a USA GB trade agreement rather than a USA UK one? That is to say, Northern Ireland be excluded from the provisions of any such agreement? So, because Northern Ireland is still part of the UK's customs territory, um, it sh should benefit from the UK's FTAs. I mean, that is a commitment from the UK in the first instance and it's been recognised by the EU. I mean, that's part of the protocol. Um, so it should benefit from um, any FTA that the UK does. However, because of the protocol, because of the application of the UCC, et cetera, um, there are very particular implications for Northern Ireland. And I would uh, I would point to agri-food as being a most obvious example. Yeah. So if you have a UK EU sorry a UK US FTA that covers that, um, um, then uh, um, which sort of um, allows goods into GB that would not be allowed into the EU, um, then there will be implications for um, what's coming into Northern Ireland. And being more careful about that, you know. So I think it's just it's become it is a very complicated situation. In theory, Northern Ireland should benefit from all the UK's FTAs, um, but in, in reality, um, the more it does, the more complexity there is for Northern Ireland in the first instance. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Christopher. Thank you, Katie and David. That was really, really helpful, um, as always. And um, hopefully, you, if, you, if we need you to come back in the future, you'd be willing to do so as well. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Peter, is there things that we have agreed or might want to agree coming out of that? I have a couple of notes um, for clarifications from the department around the likes of the EHIC card and how that will compare with the new UK Global Health card. Um, in terms of tourism, um, people going out, people coming in and so on. Um, a few other bits and pieces of clarification, but we'll put those through in our Dallow readout, Chair. Okay. Are our members happy enough or is there any comments? It's fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on then to item number five, which is matters arising. Um, a few items here. At page 35 of your pack, the Minister has um, sent us correspondence in relation to the draft consultation response paper um, and that she intends to introduce parental bereavement leave and pay legislation and provisions here in the North, which will mirror those in Britain. Um, if the members will remember this was something that we strongly endorsed at, at the, the time that the consultation was going out. So the um, introduction of stat statutory parental bereavement leave and pay will require the development of both prim primary and subordinate legislation. If the necessary support is gained, a draft bill could be ready for the Assembly for introduction early this year. This would allow time for the bill to complete its passage and become law before the end of the current mandate. The committee's views and approval is required to proceed. Um, officials are also available to brief the committee on the policy proposal. Um, so, if members are content, we'll request a briefing on the um, on the issue so that we can then ascertain if, if members are content to proceed. Great, yeah. Thank you. And, and Peter, can we request that quite quickly yeah, so that we, we can that help um, uh, move that along? Okay, so moving on then to page 38, there's a response from the Minister um, in respect of BTEX. The Minister has highlighted that learning centres, including further education colleges, schools and training providers, now have discretion to offer students vocational exams, taking into consideration a range of factors, including health and safety and the personal circumstances of their learners and staff. Students unable to sit exams will be invited to provide evidence to demonstrate how they meet the exam criteria and in some cases will be able to choose to postpone exam dates um, until a later time. Summer exams in England are cancelled and the Minister expects to take a decision um, in respect of the North quite soon. So for time being, are members content to note or have they any suggestions or comments they want to make around this? Great. Uh, 
I think it's John O'Dowd, but your camera's not on, John. Apologies. Sure, I am a written answer to a question to the Minister um, this week. And I think it goes further than that res the response we've got from them, which might be dated earlier than the, the written question response. My understanding is that BTEC exams have been cancelled uh, and that um, alternatives have been put in place. <clears throat> Here, yeah, Chair, that, that's pretty much up to the minute now. Um, we, we had discussions with the Department during the week and we were just pinning down just how much that applies to. So we know now um, the exams are cancelled. We're just trying to get a bit more detail on how that's going to impact on the um, practical assessments. We, we know some of those can go ahead. We know that the colleges are willing to facilitate that. But it's whether or not the um, qualification providers have a mechanism put in place for that. So, absolutely, um, Chair Mr. O'Dowd's right. We, we now are in a position where we know um, cancellations happen. It, it sort of happened, um, clarification that subsequent to, to the um, correspondence we received. But now we're just trying to pin down whether that's an absolute cancellation or whether there are still elements of those. Um, assessments that can go ahead. From what we gather from the colleges, they can still do some of that, but we, we'd like to try and quantify it. Yeah. I, yeah. No, I think that's important, and I think it is really important that the students get clarity because, um, and I'm sure many members have received correspondence in respect of BTEC students feeling a little bit left um, behind because their other exams were clearly cancelled and, and there was that lack of clarity around BTEC students. So if we can just get some clarity around whatever arrangements are being put in place for provision of um, what, those exams. I think Stuart's wanting to come in. Yeah, Chair, just very briefly, um, I agree with John O'Dowd. I, I got a similar answer to a question which I wrote to the Minister as well, bringing us more up to date than the correspondence which we have. But I've also had comment from some students um, around the area of will my, will my exam, and particularly the lack of practical experience because it's so difficult to get employers and it's impossible at the moment to get employers to take on uh, young people for either for work experience or uh, and also as apprentices. Uh, if I qualify at, at the end of this year or, or gain and pass an examination, will in the future an employer look back and say, oh, you did that in 2021, uh, you didn't do as well as somebody who qualified before you or perhaps post-pandemic uh, qualified after you. Um, some people are wor worried that there may indeed be a stigma around uh, getting their qualification during this period of time. Uh, and I think it's important that we ask not only the department, but indeed colleges and, and also the universities, um, how, they, how they propose to uh, address that issue. I think that, that's a fair point to take yeah. up on. So we'll we that. pursue that um, with the department and the colleges? Um, I think it's going to be one of those issues that cuts right across any kind of qualification over the last couple of years, GCSEs, A-levels, there, there's going to be Absolutely. people going to university <coughs> theoretically in September who have never actually sat an A-level exam. So it, there's a lot of issues to pin down there. So yeah. we go ahead, Chair, and pursue that. Thank you. Okay, moving on then to 5.3. At page 40 of your pack, there is a response from the Minister on the Postal Administration rules um, that the, the committee received a letter from the Minister dated the 20th of November clarifying the Postal Administration rules to bring the North into line with Britain, where similar rules have already been introduced. They're designed to ensure the continuation of the um, Universal Postal Service in the event of a company providing that service is at risk or entering insolvency proceedings. The committee's meeting on the 13th of January, members noted the correspondence from the Committee for Justice on the SL1 Postal Administration um, and had agreed to forward it on to the Department seeking an update on its view. The Department has indicated there's no change in its view. So the committee um, is happy. We will share that correspondence with the Justice Committee. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on, 5.4 then, at page 41 of your packs, there is a um, correspondence from the Committee for the Executive Office on the response from Michael Gove MP in relation to governance of the Withdrawal Agreement and Common Frameworks. This letter was forwarded by the Executive Office Committee last week, um, and uh, the letter states that each legislator, each legislature, will have an opportunity to scrutinise frameworks relating to their, um, to their region. 
So this is consistent with the phased approach that the committee previously noted. So unless there's any additional comments in respect of that, we, we will note. Great. Okay, <coughs> moving on then, page 49, there is a letter from the House of Lords EU Committee to um, Treasury seeking clarifications regarding processes for the movement of goods between the North and Britain and the majority um, will not require exit summary declarations um, that goods requiring this information can move by deeming a pre-departure and or export declaration to have been made by providing an electronic copy to British custom authorities um, with the aim of sharing this with the EU afterwards. So are members content to note at this stage mm -hmm. um, and we can pick up on any issues that are come out of that. Chair, we know the, the correspondence is live and fairly rapid um, from the, the Lords EU Committee. Uh, we've been fortunate to be able to tap into that via the TEO committee. Okay, thank you. At page 51 of your packs, there's a letter from the Lords EU Committee to Treasury regarding the single window environment for customs. The letter relates to a proposal for regulation establishing the European Union single window environment for customs and amending EU regulations. The letter asks how customs controls will be integrated between separate UK and EU single window programmes and how the British government will meet its commitment to ensure traders in the North can enjoy the benefits of both an EU and UK single um, single window environment um, and how the division of responsibility between it and the executive will work. So are members content to note? Great. Okay. Um, and then page 53, there's a letter from the Lords EU Committee to Michael Gove MP regarding the operation of the protocol. The letter highlights the recent problem of delays in goods arriving in the north and asks what support for traders there is between here and Britain. Um, the Lords Committee will be discussing these issues with businesses, with the business community from here at its meeting on the 26th of January. Are members content to note? Great. If somebody um, isn't muted and there's a wee bit of background noise yeah. coming through there. Um, if members could just put mute on. So moving on then to page 55, there's a letter from the Welsh Parliament's LCJ Committee uh, regarding the Shared Prosperity Fund. The committee sought the views um, of other committees in um, London, Cardiff and Edinburgh on the Shared Prosperity Fund. The chair of the committee has responded, indicating the committee has not undertaken a specific piece of work on the fund, however has raised the broader issue of financial assistance powers during scrutiny of the Welsh Government's legislative consent. A memorandum on the Internal Market Bill. He notes the lack of clarity as to whether such par powers were meant to replace, implement, or were se separately, entirely, separated entirely from the fund. Um, and uh, members may have noted that the um, Welsh Parliament is uh, taking legal action in respect of the financial powers um, part of the Internal Market Bill. So, are members content to note at this point? Great. Moving on then, page Chair, fifth. Yep. Sorry to. <coughs> excuse me. Um, I appreciate there is confusion around the Shared Prosperity Fund, and this is one of the issues where my membership of this committee overlaps with my membership of the Executive Office um, Committee. I don't even know who we would ask to brief us on the content of the Shared Prosperity Fund. For what the time no one. Now, I think it is important that we are given more detail around the operation and function of this fund. And if that was to require, I don't know whether, in terms of whoever's pulling it together, as it were, putting it together, if that's the Cabinet Office, would it be possible to get someone, possible to get someone even on a, on a conference call to give us some briefing about where it's at, when it's coming online, how people are going to be able to apply for it, et cetera, et cetera? Chair, absolutely. What we've been relying on mostly is uh, communication between the um, EU, uh, Lords EU Committee and the Cabinet Office, Michael Gove. Mm. So that's pretty much where we're likely to go. I understand this falls under his um, special remit. Well, can we ask for officials from the Cabinet Office or from the Minister himself? Um, absolutely. We will, we will write for that. To tell us where this is at, because I think it's really, really important that we get some more detail on this stuff. Aside from anything, it's just the most basic level to ensure that the, the promise, the, to ensure that the promise that was made vis-a-vis uh, -vis the level of funding is kept. Yep, go ahead. 
Chair, the that, members that reflects, content? Great, yeah. That reflects the, the kind of feedback we've had from sister committees everywhere that there's just no clarity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, moving on then to page 57, there's a paper from the National Engineering Policy Centre regarding um, response to COVID-19 and decarbonisation. The report sets out from an engineering perspective the opportunities for decarbonisation as we respond to COVID-19. It focuses on the net zero challenge um, more than the broader green issues, for example, resource efficiency and air quality while recognising that these are connected. Um, has synergies, obviously, with our energy strategy and micro-inquiry special report, so it's worth um, considering it in that context. Our members content to note for now, and um, we will return to it at some point, along with our energy strategy work. Great. Um, on page 72, then, there is a note from an individual in relation to the development of the energy strategy, um, highlighting the importance of setting targets and the various renewable sources available to reach um, zero-carbon future. Our members content to note. Yep. Great, yeah. Then at page <coughs> 73, um, there is some points regarding the student roost and the waiving of fees. The committee discussed this issue last week and had written to universities and accommodation um, providers. There's a range of options has been available to students at some of the premises, such as cancelling of the contract if the student needs to move out or offering a payment holiday. The information in the pack is a summary of the options offered by Student Roost and is for clarification. Um, um, and I know from dealing with constituents, it has been very difficult to get any of them, either payment holidays or contract cancellations. Um, and uh, the committee had agreed to make representation that they needed to show a more flexible attitude to the first semester, similar to what is being adopted in the second semester. Chair, what we what we wanted to do was see if we could get um, some specifics. So, if members are content, we're we're looking for more information before we write that. So, what I'm looking for today is if members are content, we we seek individual issues. Probably we'll go through NUSUSI on that. Um, they'll have a lot of membership that's actually lived in the accommodation or has had yeah. dealings with the accommodation. And if I suppose we will also be able to provide some yeah, we individuals have, yeah. who have not been able to avail of any of those options. So committee members may have yeah, some Yeah, I suspect they'll have, they'll have had those directly, Chair. So it just allows us to highlight individual cases where you you know you can say this is this is actually what's happened rather than um, often when you write just for clarification, without that, that kind of case study specific, you don't get quite as useful an answer, if I could put it that way. So if I can ask members if they have specific instances of individuals, if they want to forward those on to me, and we'll also talk to the, the student representative bodies to look for that as well. It just, it just gives the letter a bit more heft, you know. Yep. Okay. Um, student Roost Chair is a, a private accommodation provider. Yep, they, they have a couple of blocks. Yep, um, more of them, yeah. In the city centre, and I yeah. think they have some elsewhere as well. No, yeah. are they the old tech? Yeah, they are. Yes, and, and yeah. around the corner as well um, yeah. from the ombudsman's office. Uh, so they, it's quite a lot, and they spend a lot of money there. So yeah. you know, there's about good to be quality a lot of accommodation. Costs. You know, and it's, it really is. And it is. It's all sort of. I think most provides, of it's on suite. It, it is kind of provides um, a good service, but but it's expensive, obviously, and and it's now a liability for students that are not not a. You know, not at university, so yes, we will. But sure, we collate that do we and can. We, we write um, on with specifics. I think that that's just more likely to get a, yep. mm -hmm. a, a decent response. Okay. We're okay, moving on then to 5.12. At page three of table papers, there's a response for from the Minister for State, the one that Gary highlighted earlier um, in relation to correspondence from the committee um, before the TCA was agreed. Um, so it highlights that there is help for businesses to prepare. There's the new Trader Support Service um, alongside the Movement Assistance Scheme, which has been created for agri-food traders who are moving goods um, where specific SPS controls apply and that the, the government will meet those costs. The Trader Support Scheme has been established, allowing authorised businesses to move their goods with no tariff liabilities. Um, and then in respect of the grace periods, the ministers highlighted that trusted traders such as supermarkets, small retailers and their suppliers will benefit from the three-month grace period. And then finally, um, he highlights the, um, the 400 million that was announced by Treasury 
in on the 10th of December to boost economic growth. Um, so unless members have any additional comments other than those that Gary's already highlighted. Well, uh, Chair, this brings me back to uh, the uh, earlier discussion. If you look at the uh, page five of the, table, the the various bullet points in the letter, improve the flow of goods and travel to and from Great Britain and across Northern Ireland, boosting access to opportunities. That is patently not what is happening. And the government persists in seeking to deny that which we can all see. And I think it's really important that their feet are held to the fire on this, because promises were made to the people in Northern Ireland by this government in terms of our trade and access to the biggest, our biggest market, which is the, the uh, Great British domestic market. And it's well for a Minister of State, um, you know, riding from number one Horse Guards Road, London, to put stuff in a letter saying this is uh, our assessment of the situation. But I can tell you that the assessment of the situation in the Port of Larne or in the Port of Belfast is very different from it is in number one Horse Guards Road. So I really do think it's important that their feet are held to the fire on this and that the promises that were made by this government to the people in Northern Ireland are kept. Chair, we can, we can ask for briefing directly from um, Minister of State Walker. Yes. So that they can essentially um, be questioned on these points they've made. Get them in. Yeah. <laughs> now with Starleaf, we can, we can travel the world, including oh, Horse Guards Parade. <laughs> And, and I think we should take back control. <laughs> take back what? Control. Ah. Uh-huh. Um, the one I handed to you. We did. Stop, last... stop, stop. <laughs> <laughs> we did last week agree to raise these issues with um, Michael Gove, and the committee has written yeah. to him outlining the need for that support for businesses to actually manifest. Mm -hmm. And for but the great series to be, be utilised effectively, so yeah. I think that let's let's get let's get yeah. Thank you. Okay, moving on then. Um, Five point thirteen at page six of your table papers. There is correspondence from Gemma Dolan, MLA, indicating that the consultation um, period for her private members' bill on zero hour contracts has come to an end, and the final proposal has been submitted to the bills office. So are members content to note? Yes. Good. At 5.14 then, at page 7 of the table papers, there's correspondence from the NI Business and Human Rights Forum comprising the agenda for the forum's latest meeting, which took place on Monday the 18th, and the minutes of its last meeting on Thursday the 15th of October, and the work plan for 2021-22. The committee agreed that the clerk would attend these meetings on behalf of the committee and reflect um, on the meeting. So, Peter, do you want to... Offer any chair? Yep, yeah, we we had the the meeting on Monday, and the, the two speakers were focusing on how you you take um, these issues in business from just being part of of governance speak to actually living them through. And a lot of the focus was on ensuring that supply chains are um, completely clear and clean from from any kind of human trafficking or human exploitation. So it follows on, I think, from, from a lot of work that's actually been discussed previously in the Assembly, where this idea of ensuring that not just um, the, the final good that's produced here or, or you know, in the EU or wherever else is, is clean and free of any of these kinds of issues, but that the entire supply chain is. So they were offering a lot of very useful advice um, on how businesses can actually ensure that and how they can make that part of their business model. So I, I think there, there'll be more advice coming through from that. And, and um, I know they have a, a wide network of business people that they deal with. So I, I'll keep the committee updated as that go for, goes forward. But it might be useful at some stage in the future to get another briefing on that, just to, to, to raise the profile of the issues. Yes, we also agreed when we met them that we would seek an informal meeting with them to... Well, we had, we had, the, um, we had them in before Christmas, um, and they updated on sort of what the, the sort of flow of work is then. So as and when we get um, more output, we, we can bring them back in. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Chair.
So moving on, 5.15, at page 14 of your table papers, there's correspondence from NUS USI um, on the issues facing um, membership currently. If the committee remembers, we had sought updates at the start of semester two from colleges, universities, the student organisations, and also lecturer representatives. Um, so this is the response from NUS USI, highlights the need for clarity around BTEC students' issues on accommodation and rent. Um, no detriment policies in terms of assessments, difficulties accessing the Student Hardship Fund, um, Erasmus Plus, digital poverty and then tuition fees. And members will be familiar with all of these issues um, and we have corresponded consistently with student representatives over the past number of months. Um, is there anything in this that members want to highlight specifically? Um, other than that, we will be writing to the Minister on the issues raised by the student representatives. Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Right. I'll take Minister. <laughs> Go ahead, John. <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, is it, sorry, Chair. Um, I think the, 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 this highlights a, a, an ongoing issue and also highlights the point that the Student Hardship Fund isn't working for the needs of students and probably was never designed and in fact wasn't designed for the scale of financial pressures that students are now facing. And I think there is now an onus on the department to make a bid for specific funding to alleviate the financial pressures that students are facing. Um, I understand there is quite significant underspends uh, from a number of departments in relation to COVID funding and surely COVID funding would cover or would be allowed to cover a financial um, grant for students to recognise the situation they face, whether it's through rent, whether it's through not getting the, the experience of education they, they signed up for in terms of their student fees. And it's also worth remembering, uh, and this isn't a directly a financial matter, but students are probably going to be facing this for the next academic year as well, because the vaccination programme is designed for adults uh, up to a certain age. Many of our students may not get the, those vaccinations to the very, very end, if at all. So even in terms of, of the student accommodation we discussed earlier, it, it may not be possible for students to come together in large numbers in, in, in accommodation uh, in the future. So there needs to be advice given to students about the implications of st signing up to contracts in, in rental accommodation, particularly private rental accommodation. But, but there needs to be a plan for our universities and colleges for the next uh, academic year as well, because many of the problems they're facing now, they're going to face in the next academic year as well. Chair, can, I, can yeah. I come in there as well? Yeah, go ahead. I think we've got to the stage, we, we, we talk about this week in, week out um, at our committee meetings. I think we've got to the stage now that we really need to speak to the Minister directly in relation to that. I see that she has communicated during the week that um, she has asked her officials to look into this. But this is a matter of urgency. We're now in the second term. Approaching the third term will, will be difficult as well. So this is a full uh, a full year um, out of a student's life. Uh, and, and, you know, every level of society has got support of some shape, form or fashion as a result of COVID, except students. Uh, and I really fear for their mental health around all of this as well. There's an awful lot of family pressures um, uh, in relation to the fees that they're paying um, for, um, for, for tuition, which they're not receiving face to face, but also for uh, accommodation that they're not uh, sitting in. I had a, a, a constituent that um, contacted me the other day and uh, the, the student is, is, is in England, but £900 was taken out of her um, current account the other day and she's sitting um, here in Derry. Uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable that, that our students are not getting any support at all and I think that there's an, an obligation that we prioritise and make this an urgent ask of the Minister to to, to have some form of, of um, either as, as John says either a rebate um, or, or, or additional support for students that go directly to the student um, not to the universities but to the student. Thanks, Junaid. Christopher, sorry, you wanted to come in? Yeah, well? just, uh, I think I don't disagree with the, the broad principles of what either John or Sinead have said. I think we also just, we do need to be mindful of the fact that 
I mean, John has said that there's significant underspends, and if that is the case, then obviously then that's something that should be looked at. I'm mindful of the fact that I think the minister submitted a request not so long ago, and oh. she got basically one pound in every three that she requested from the centre. So I would be interested just to see if there are those underspends and how they should be deployed. But I absolutely agree in terms of, and I speak, I suppose, just to declare an interest. I have a niece who's in the first year of her law degree at Queen's, and it's not been a year of education, really. It's like online learning is not the same as face-to-face -face learning, and we all know that. And I suppose, <laughs> at, a much, at a miniature level, I, I'm speaking as a parent of a wee girl that's in P6, and P6 is such an important year. She's completely lost that entire year of her, of her education. Um, I think, so within the constraints of the budgets, of course we should be seeking uh, to help people. But I, I, I said this last week, and I think it's really important. Advice services provided by the universities is really important as well, because uh, whilst it would be the moral and the decent thing to give people a, a rate or a, a rent relaxation, a rent holiday, if you've signed a contract, you've signed a contract. And therefore, it's really important, I think, that we're investing in advice services in order to just help people not get themselves trapped in situations where they're paying for things that, whilst they signed for it in the full expectation that they were going to need it, they don't. Yeah, Chair, I think that that's going to be the, the key problem with the private rentals, as I suspect they're renting until May. Yes. That, that will have been part of the contract. At least sometimes they, they do longer just if they want to hold on to a house or whatever. Um, in terms of the the money that's gone back, say for example from the voucher scheme, we, we don't know yet um, the outcome of the January monitoring, so it, it might be worth getting something in quickly now to both the Minister and the Finance Minister, uh, potentially even FM and DFM, just to flag up that, look, if there is COVID ring-fenced money identifiable um, for support for students in whatever form you know can mm. be managed, that it's a good use of that money and it would probably fall in with that ring-fenced COVID criteria. Yeah. And there is obviously a mechanism to, to get money to students yeah. through student loans company, through student finance. So, you know, there is a ready it's mechanism that could be used to deliver money. I, I think also, and Peter's reminded me here, we have written to the university's minister in Britain because clearly there is a responsibility there as well in, in respect of student fees. Um, because this is not an issue that is unique to here. This is an issue that applies everywhere um, this this particular year. So the, the British government needs to look at, at this issue in terms of, of what it's doing to alleviate student issues. And NUS in, in Britain has been highlighting the same issues that NUS USA have been highlighting here. So I think if we can see where that correspondence is we and will, if we, we need to reflect course. further issues that have been highlighted to us, just because of the longevity of the situation. But if members are content to go ahead with the, the correspondence to FMDFM yes, absolutely. Economy and Finance, just to flag up, look, this is a, a potentially useful issue to look at for, for January monitoring outcome. It's fine, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, it's fine. We have uh, heard that this week, I think the Welsh Government has put a significant amount of money um, into uh, a fund to support students. So I think that, you know, there there are best practice uh, elsewhere. The Irish Government, for example, has given every student um, money within, uh, I think, every university student or and higher uh, further education students in the Republic of uh, Ireland money as well. So I think that we need to look at best practice um, right around um, Europe to see what has actually been done for the student population um, and because it's pitiful what we have actually done here in the UK for our student population. Okay, thank you. Up, Chair. Um, then moving on to page 16 of table papers, there's correspondence from UCU on issues facing its membership, and it highlights two specific ones in relation to the staggering of student returns and also to staff wellbeing. Um, and if members are content, we will also highlight these issues to the Minister. Okay, yep. Thank you. Moving on then to page 18 of tabled papers, there is the department's weekly sit rep. Um, and Peter, there was just one I wanted to pick out of it in relation to the B&B &B fund, which is saying goes live tomorrow. So Good. I don't think we've had detail on that. No, no. Chair, that was one that was agreed at the executive quite a while ago, and, and then various other things happened, and 
um, we, we didn't really hear an awful lot more about it. So it'll be useful to get uh, more info on that. Chair, just Gary. Yep, sure. wants to comment as well. Gary, sorry, you wanting to come in? Yeah, it's not just an, exactly the same issue, Chair. So maybe you want to finish on that first. It's just a slightly different issue on the same on the same document. Yeah, no, we just seek clarity on on the B and B issue. If members are content. Yeah. And maybe yeah. we could get something back on that today. That'll be good. Yeah. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just firstly, I want to concur on the issues regarding students. I, I think that it does need to be addressed. Just today, I, I dealt with a call regarding a student uh, and it's regarding the, the fees issue. And it is a disgrace at this moment in time that students are left in that position. So I fully support uh, the comments that have been made. Uh, the point that I wanted to make, obviously the summary of issues uh, and uh, the economic impact issues that have been raised uh, are all relevant. But there's one issue that I did want to raise and hopefully get support of the committee to write to the economy minister and, and to the executive on. And it was touched on in the chamber a few times around the, um, the, the unfair balance between multinationals and some of the small businesses. Uh, I raised this issue uh, during the question time from the First and Deputy First Minister, uh, and I was assured that uh, they would be looking into how to address that imbalance and, and I suppose the unfair uh, playing field that multinationals and small businesses are currently on. Uh, one of the issues that was raised was around the click and collect service, and I know that many businesses, particularly who have perishable items, would really benefit from that click and collect. And I, I fully acknowledge that at times the click and collect service may have been abused by a very small number of businesses. But I think that there's an opportunity to look at that, particularly given the executive that will be reviewing the restrictions tomorrow. I think that as a committee, we need to make it known that there needs to be an addressing of that unfair playing field between some of the multinationals and some of the small businesses who are forced to close, yet they sell exactly the same product. So I was just hoping maybe the committee could uh, put that in some sort of wording uh, to the executive, reiterating obviously our support for um, ensuring that people are kept safe as well. Do you want to come in there as well? Thanks, Chair. Just to, to back up what Gary has said, I think it, it is imperative that we as a committee highlight um, that unfair and lack of balance that we're seeing. Um, a lot of businesses have been severely hit by COVID, but some have done very well. And that mainly goes for the big multinational companies whose trades, you only have to look at the post-Christmas trading figures, have been through the roof in many cases with click and collect continuing and their ability to offer delivery services. So I think we need to do see it, rebalancing of that. That can be done in a number of ways too. I mean, the, the finance minister announced this week about the extension of business rate relief. And I think that needs to be significantly targeted um, to our independent retail and indigenous businesses and making sure that we don't see rate relief, for example, for the big multinationals. Um, thankfully, some have given it back in previous, um, and there are examples of them giving it back, but not all are as morally right in how they do it. And I think that needs to happen. Likewise, for the voucher scheme, for example, whenever there is hopefully a lot of confidence that can still go ahead in the new financial year whenever lockdown ends. And again, if it would be, I think, unfair to see that money being able to be used with big international and multinational companies rather than our indigenous independent sector. So there are ways and creative ways of doing it through the stimulus packages that we're offering. Um, and also, um, as I say, even in our playing field, I think it's just unfair that products that are banned from some independent retailers are still being able to be sold in our in our big um, stores. So absolutely right. And just to come in on the um, the student stuff, because I know there was a big long discussion out there, um, I think we do need to, to highlight these even more. I know my constituents come to me today still trying to get clarity on why even after they pulled out a week into their course, they're still being asked to pay almost a third of their fees. Um, there, there are numerous examples of these and we really need to do what we can to highlight them and try and get solutions for, for individuals. Thanks. Um, Gordon, sorry. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, no, I would endorse the points that have been made. There is that ongoing problem about the independent retail sector and who occupy you know, quite large sites within our high streets. They've been closed now for a considerable amount of period and their competitors are able to to sell similar goods. So I would be, you know, supportive of of the uh, getting them a click and collect, which must be need to be monitored and needs to be uh, obviously COVID compliant. 
And it's not an opportunity for people to come in and browse around the shop. It's about coming in, click, and it's coming in and obviously collect the products that have been pre-ordered and paid for. And I think we should, you know, urge the executive to look again at that. I do welcome the BNB thing, something that I've been going on about here now for a number of weeks, and it's great and well done uh, to those that have pushed it. And, and um, the, the sit rep is very useful, and we do appreciate it. And I think it, it's great to keep that information in mind. The hotel sector is something again we've raised regularly. They still haven't got any fund directly, and that has been running now for almost a year. They've had indirect support through furlough and rates, but they've had no direct support and the huge investment in our hotels there and um, they've been lying empty so we're keeping the pressure on for it and I think it's important something comes through shortly. Yeah we have correspondence later on in our pack from the Hotels Federation so we, we can pick up that, that yes. specific Yeah they've been going on a, yeah, lobbying heavy on that. Yeah. Thanks Chair. Thanks Gordon. Um, I think John Stewart's looking back in there. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute. Sorry to hold it. Um, I can't open the sit rep, so I'm guessing what might be in there. So I'll use this opportunity. Um, um, just around the CRBSS grant, um, there is a, a lot, as I'm sure other members are getting contact from those who have successfully applied previously and have been assured that they're going to get paid, but no clarity as to when the second payment's coming. Um, I tried, uh, I think, and I'm not entirely sure whether I got an outcome yesterday. I phoned Invest and I twice yesterday and spoke to two different people. One told me the payment would be made this week to those who were successful. Um, another said that they had no idea when the payment would be made and they hadn't been given the go ahead to make the payments yet. So you can imagine the frustration among those um, constituents and business owners who are trying to get clarity. Can, have, have we had any updates on, on when that payment will be made? Last week, we are still waiting for full clarification on that. Bits and pieces are coming through, and quite often um, they come through in the set rep. We get the set rep every Tuesday, so that that's kind of become a, a, a point of information. But we have all those uh, queries already into the department, so we are waiting for a response. Okay. Yeah, I just I just think it's desperately, it's just unacceptable to be quite honest. I don't want to pin blame on anybody, but. We're a couple of weeks on from when we heard it was extended, and if these have already qualified for it, I know it's not as simple as pushing a button, but there should be a very easy way of getting these payments made. The bank details are in place. They've already met the criteria, and the information flow is shocking. And these are business owners who rely on this money week to week in normal practice, and they have no, no end in sight. I and mean, people are talking about not able to make their mortgage payments, not able to make their, their rent payments. On their, um, it's just unacceptable. And I think we need to get clarity as quickly as possible on whenever that's going to come out. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Peter, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go on ahead, Sinead. No, um, I, I think John has articulated the situation really well. And the SIP rep's really good information that comes out uh, to us. But we do have a, a real difficulty of getting answers to your questions from the various departments, uh, and it's really, really slow. It, it, it's making, I suppose, all members are, are feeling the frustration because it's making us look as if, uh, you know, uh, we can't do our jobs as well because we just can't get answers to questions when these payments will be made. Uh, and sometimes we can't even get through to the various departments as well. Uh, for even to put the question, so uh, and this has been a long-standing job and a, and a long-standing problem. And I know that we have um, tried and endeavoured to try and have workarounds, but they're not working. Um, Peter, if we we had already discussed last week, um, wanting to get some more information on potential schemes, and we might pick up on this later as well. But um, it, we we will seek if. Chair, Perhaps. I think it might be useful if we can get officials in, yeah. just just so that they're there on the spot and can answer questions. They may be able to provide more up to the minute yeah. information. Yeah. Okay. Agreed. Just in relation to writing um, in, in respect of independent retailers and that situation, I think if we can seek some clarity around that, um, obviously there are issues there as well with you know the stay-at-home direction and, and bringing staff in and things. Um, so anything that would be done in that sphere would have to be on the basis of the medical and health advice as well. So if we could just seek some clarification around what, what the executive is doing in respect of that. Obviously they met with the retailers last Friday. Um, so it might be useful to get some 
information on the output from that meeting. Okay, moving on then to item number 518, which is um, members are probably aware that last week the Supreme Court ruled in favour of the claimants in the test case um, on payment of business interruption insurance. Um, the committee had asked the clerk to seek the views um, of the impact on local businesses. Chair, the, the thing with this one was people were quick to come back, but the answer is generally, yeah, this is good. This, this is potentially going to be really helpful for our memberships. The big worry, the big, the big worry is that the insurance companies drag their feet um, and drag the whole process out mm. uh, and are not making payments quickly. Um, I, and I assume perhaps it was shared with other members as well, got correspondence from ABI basically yeah. saying that business or insurers were going to be paying out. It might be useful to get some feedback in yeah. relation to anybody's experiences of dealing with insurance companies. Sure, that, that's kind of where I've left it with the, particularly the, the membership organisations for small independent retailers uh, and other businesses. Um, what we'll do is we can go back to ABI as well, because obviously the, the committee had that confirmation from them, um, and if they see if they want to put a time scale on repayment might be useful if we can get that. Um, so, Chair, if members are content, we can we can go back and ask for that. Yep. Okay. Okay. Moving on then to item number six, which is correspondence. Um, page seventy-five. There's correspondence from the ERA committee on EU tariffs on gift goods at risks. The ERA committee recently discussed the tariffs for agri-food products and members expressed concerns that it's still unclear if a tariff system requires a tariff to be paid up front, whether it be it provided respectively if the goods remain um, here in this jurisdiction. It would appear that tariffs apply to many products and this is causing significant difficulties to the agri-food industry which already experiences tight profit margins. Um, for example, reported tariffs for animal feeds is as high as £85 per tonne which for the animal feed industry is a huge concern. So the ERA committee has asked the committee to highlight these ongoing issues and the consequences of the lack of clarity on tariffs on goods at risk and the mechanism for subsequent rebate for goods um, that stay here. So in matters arising, we've already noted some letters from the House of Lords committees mm. to the Treasury on mm. movement of goods and customs declarations. So if members are agree, we will write to Treasury to ask for clarification on these issues and we'll copy the response then to the area and finance committees. Are members Paid. content? Paid, yeah. Thank you. Page 76 then, um, there's correspondence from Healthy Place to Work, an organisation which provides healthy workplaces leading to more viable and sustainable businesses. It's offering to brief the committee. Um, we will, if members are content, set up an informal briefing for a later date. Um, it might also be useful for our remote working mm -hmm. inquiry when we're organising that, so that might tie in. We can right. keep that in mind, then page 77 is the 18th report of the examiner of statutory rules. Are members content to note? Great. And then at page 87 is the 19th report. Are members content to note? Great. Okay, then moving on to um, page 18 of table papers. There's correspondence from the Committee for Finance um, who last week considered correspondence from Spiral Hosting in relation to reported Ulster Bank application to the High Court to transfer its business holding to its parent NatWest. Um, members of the Finance Committee have expressed concerns around the development of a banking monopoly um, and the possible adverse impact on jobs and furtherance of trade here. So the Committee Office is um, already in the process of organising briefings with banks. Chair, we had a useful meeting with the Ulster Bank actually last week where they clarified how separate business here is from business in the south. Those are two entirely separate entities. So announcements being made for Ulster Bank in the south are, are very separate to Ulster Bank here. What essentially um, the, the um, issue that's been addressed in this correspondence does is reinforces that. It makes it very clear that Ulster Bank here and Ulster Bank in the South are two separate businesses. Th there was never any question that either wasn't part of um, NatWest, but now it's just made it super clear that that is two absolutely separate businesses. Um, so th there was nothing particularly about creating any kind of monopoly. The, you know, 
the, the bank was owned. The, the other interesting thing that actually came out of the meeting was um, how, how perhaps people don't appreciate the fact that the likes of Santander has a massive business here, um, bigger than perhaps what people would describe as the local banks. So we're looking to involve banks like that in briefing the committee because they, they have a huge stake in uh, mortgage market, loans market, business um, accounts and so on that, that people maybe don't realise. So it, it was a very, um, it was a useful conversation. It was an enlightening conversation. And our plan now is to get UK finance plus perhaps five, maybe six uh, banks coming to brief the committee just to, to clarify a lot of issues, clarify direction of travel uh, around um, in branch services, things like that. So we, we have that in hand, Chair. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, moving on then to item 6.6, .6. at page 25, this correspondence from the Finance Committee. It considered correspondence from the Department in respect of engagement with the Association of Northern Ireland Travel Agents uh, regarding a COVID-19 support scheme. Members expressed concerns around the delay in developing um, a necessary scheme. Um, Peter, this is something maybe we could correspond with the, the uh, Department and the Minister on. Um, it's one of those groups that have been left out of, of support and if there is underspend remaining and we know the 54 million is um, being returned to the centre in terms of COVID support schemes so if there's the potential to make additional bids well this is one of the sectors obviously that may um, be able to benefit. Sure, it might be helpful if we copy that to Finance Minister FM and DFM just because this will be an executive issue being picked up. Yep, that's, uh, Thank you. members are content. Sure. Yep, John, sure. go ahead. Uh, sure, I, I've had some correspondence from the, the, the group just seeking clarity as to which is the lead department in regards to uh, any potential scheme. Is there any clarity in that? Chair, our understanding was that finance were looking at it, but it, it would be you would have assumed that it would be a, a part of the suite of the um, support systems and schemes that economy was creating. It's one of those situations where there's a policy lead, which you would assume was economy, but it was actually finance that was trying to work out details of payment, how payment could be made, or how a scheme would work um, in terms of the data and so on that they had their hands on. So hopefully what we can seek to do is clarify both those issues. But I think if we can get that issue to the executive for this consideration during January monitoring, where there's COVID money that might well be good, put to good use on this, that's probably the priority. Yeah, and similarly, if there are other um, groups or sectors that remain on. Um, resolved, like local newspapers is one that hasn't received any support, yeah. um, and then there are the issues that we're still aware of in respect in the of and so on, the, um, the non-rate paying uh, bars within sports clubs and mm. so on as well. Yeah, the events sector yeah. we know as well as one that is still yeah. missed out, There's and then there is that issue there. with the those people who became self-employed in, in late mm -hmm. 18, 19. Yeah. You know, there are a few groups. If the committee was willing to highlight that, you know, if there is funding available, it should be directed at getting money to those who still need it. And members are content. Yes, that's fine. Chair, I may end up rolling some correspondence together, actually, because I'm just mm -hmm. thinking there's some I can pick up and, and put together. OK. Um, so moving on, then, there is more correspondence from the Finance Committee. Um, they consider correspondence from the Committee for Infrastructure in respect of committee scrutiny of January monitoring, the committee agreed to write to the Minister for Infrastructure to copy and copy to all relevant, um, or sorry, to copy correspondence to all statutory committee chairpersons for their information. Um, and members will know that the January monitoring process was rerun and not finalised until after the beginning of January. So members are content to note. Great. Yes. <clears throat> um, then moving on, page 30 of table papers, there's a BBC News article brought to the attention of the committee by NUS USA um, and it's already been highlighted in relation to the 40 million that has been made available by the Welsh Government to support students, so we've already discussed those issues. Yeah. Um, and then moving on, 6.9 at page 37 of table papers, there is a letter from the NI Hotels Federation to the Economy Minister. The Federation is seeking the Minister's help in supporting hotels and ensuring the infrastructure of tourism survives the pandemic. Um, 
and there is a short document which outlines um, its position and some of their asks. Um, so, sorry, somebody isn't on mute, and there's a wee bit of... There's a mouse running up and down someone's keyboard. <laughs> a wee bit of background noise there. Um, it's just some of the asks of the Hotels Federation members will be familiar with. Some of them we've already raised. There is the issue around VAT, which the Finance Minister addressed, um, I think, the other day when he made a statement that he's still making representation around that issue. Um, so it, members will also know that the Tourism uh, Recovery Strategy Group was doing an action plan, and we had heard there was a draft of that that was... Chair, we, we saw the draft, but from what I understand from the sector, that, that has not been moved on with them. So... This could be an opportunity to just check where all of that stands. Um, I'm getting some soundings from the sector um, that they they feel that they could uh, that they would appreciate much more engagement from the tourism recovery group, but also from TNI. So it, it might be a case of flagging these issues up with the minister that, that the sector has particular and specific asks that they would like um, pursued. Members if members agree, yep. Um, and Peter, did we get clarification on when the Temp or the large hospitality scheme is. I want to say yes. Coming. I want to say yes, but I cannot mm. say that with my hand on my heart. So I will go back and check, Chair. Okay. Thank um, you. It's, pen, it's certainly pending, Chair. But it, it has been around. commented on so many times. Yeah. And, and yeah. But it be that's the fact that it has been publicised and profiled so many times, but I don't think it is actually... I don't know if there's no, been an announcement. That. But we'll check back on that. we we'll check okay. back on that. OK, thank you. So moving on then to item number 10, the draft budget 2021-22. Um, at page 42 of table papers, there is the finance minister's statement from Monday. There is a copy of the draft budget at page 52 of table papers. Um, the finance minister set the context of the budget as being an extremely difficult financial picture and um, having greatly reduced COVID support um, compared to this year, or last year, this year, still this year. Yeah, still this year. Um, the Department for the Economy has been allocated $821.3 in non-ring fenced resource Dell. Um, 89.8 million in capital Dell, 34.7 million in FTC, um, with a 2 million allocation for city deals. Approximately 127 million of COVID support is currently being held at the centre. The allocation represents a 2% increase on the department's 2020-21 non-ring fenced um, resource Dell allocation, which effectively is a flat line budget. So the budget consultation runs until the 25th of February and the finance minister hasn't indicated when he would make a statement on the outcome of January monitoring, although he said it would be It's going to be soon. soon. It'll have to be soon. Um, so the department's priorities are set out at page 82 to 85 of um, the, the table paper. So members want to, to take a, a look at those um, to see if there's... Anything that they want to highlight in Chair, respect how that of those? Divides down is on page eighty two is the reflection of what the department is, what it does, and highlights the connections to the existing draft PFG. Um, and then page eighty three goes on to um, <coughs> talk about what normal recurring business is. So it, it sets that out. So I suppose perhaps the most um, interesting and relevant bits are page eighty four and five where they start to talk about um, what the priorities are going to be during 21-22, which you've got listed there, skills strategy, tourism strategy, energy strategy, city deals, project stratum, EU exit and PFG. These are things that the committee's pretty much doing work on all of those. Um, so I suppose, Chair, the, the, the problem that there is is it's not drilled down yet. This is This is effectively... The allocation and the department's reflection of the areas it's going to prioritise. So at this point in time, there isn't more detail on that. So really what we need to be asking the department for is when they can come on brief on the detail. Okay. Uh, if members are content, we, we'll go ahead and push for that. Yep. Great, yeah. But I should just um, reflect on the fact that this is now just announced uh, and also there will probably be some level of impact from January monitoring, um, 
So it, it might be a bit of a, an unclear situation, at least maybe for the next week or so. Um, so just if members just want to bear that in mind. Okay. Moving on then, item number seven is any other business and none has been indicated. Um, and then moving on to item number eight, which is the date, time and place of the next meeting, which is next Thursday at, oh sorry, it's tomorrow at 11 yes. a.m. We have an informal meeting informal with the um, Community Energy and Drumlin Wind Energy Cooperative. Um, they will be making a presentation around community energy. And then our next um, physical meeting is next Wednesday, 27th of January in room 29. Um, and that's our short meeting that finishes by 12 to allow another committee um, to use the room afterwards. So that is all for now. Um, we are now moving into closed session. So I'm just going to knock this off. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.